Welcome. Welcome everyone to Abolition Democracy 813. Uh, this is a historic moment. The first full day of a new presidential administration, an administration that includes the first woman, the first woman of color as vice president of this nation. But it's also a historic moment for another reason. This is the first time in American history, in American history, that a president of the United States has declared himself to be an abolitionist. This is in fact the first full day of having what? an abolitionist and declared president. himself as an abolitionist. Yeah, now, he, is, he is the first sitting president to ever. Indeed. Indeed, um, President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris have committed themselves to the abolition of the death penalty. As you know, it was on the website, uh, President Biden etched the following words in ink or in pixels, eliminate the death penalty. They wrote over 160 individuals who've been sentenced to death in this country since 1973 have ever have later been exonerated because we cannot ensure we get death penalty cases right every time. Biden will work to pass legislation to eliminate the death penalty at the federal level and incentivize states to follow the federal government's example. These individuals should instead serve life sentences. Now, uh, Fonda Shen did some research. We just posted on the website. There's no other president of the United States who ever opposed the death penalty while in office. Now, President Jimmy Carter, uh, who has become an extraordinary human rights advocate, uh, came to oppose it after he left office. Um, but of course, he signed uh, into law the, the Georgia death penalty statute that was upheld in Greg versus Georgia. Rutherford Hayes came to oppose it as well afterwards, but no president ever has ever outright said that they oppose the death penalty. And so it is truly uh, a historic moment uh, and, uh, and a historic day. And on this, the first full day uh, of a presidential administration uh, that is in favor of abolishing the death penalty, we come together to press forward uh, this important abolitionist agenda and to discuss uh, not only abolishing the death penalty, but also to understand uh, and particularly the most awful and the most harrowing aspect of the death penalty, and namely the harm that it does, the trauma it inflicts on everyone who comes close to it, especially the family and friends of those on death row or those who are executed, but also the journalists who are compelled to watch executions, the, the lawyers who are constantly enmeshed in the machinery of death, the ministers, the counselors, the wardens, the prison guards, and some all of, the, all of the people that surround uh, these executions and death row. So we're gonna be treating today two of the most important issues of abolition democracy. Uh, first, the past. We'll be discussing the harrowing experience of past executions, especially uh, in light of the horrifying uh, killing spree uh, we just lived through with 13 federal executions uh, in less than, uh, in, in, in less than six months. Um, so we'll be looking at the past and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the horror uh, of uh, executions on, on families uh, and others, but we'll also be looking at the future and we're gonna discuss how uh, to bring about the abolition of the death penalty with a new president who is opposed uh, to capital punishment. Now, we're really fortunate to be joined today uh, by uh, Representative Adriano Espaillat, who recently uh, introduced a bill to abolish the uh, federal death penalty uh, in Congress. Uh, and we have an extraordinary panel of death penalty experts. Uh, so let me invite our, our panelists on. Uh, we're, we're in, we are joined by uh, The Intercept journalist uh, Liliana Segura, who has been tirelessly covering every single federal execution at Terre Haute uh, this past year. Thanks for joining us, Liliana. Uh, we have with us attorney Kelly Henry, 
who represented uh, the only woman on federal death row. Thank you, Kelly, for joining us. Uh, Kelly represented uh, Lisa Montgomery, uh, who, as you all know, was executed on January 13th, uh, 2021, uh, just last week. We have with us as well, Susanna Sheffer, who is a psychotherapist and who has studied extensively uh, the trauma of executions on the family of uh, the executed. Thanks, Susanna, for joining us. We have as well with us uh, Lee Greenwood, uh, whose son, uh, Joseph Nichols, was executed by the state of, Ala by the state of Texas uh, in 2007. Uh, Lee is down uh, in Houston. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, the weather is uh, difficult and the Wi-Fi is coming in and out, uh, but we're delighted that you're here, Ms. Greenwood, and uh, we're gonna make this work, I, I assure you. And thank you so much. And I'm so sorry for the loss of your son. In addition, we have my extraordinary colleague, the brilliant Alexis Hogue, a practitioner in residence at the Holder Initiative for Civil and Political Rights here at Columbia University and a longtime death penalty uh, defense attorney. Now, uh, uh, part, of the, um, uh, part of the work that's being done here is it really in collaboration uh, with the Texas After Violence Project, which is a project down in Texas which uh, Susanna Sheffer works with and, and Lee Greenwood has worked with as well. And so we're delighted to be kind of uh, thinking with them about the, the harms uh, of the death penalty. Now I'll introduce everyone more formally on the podium uh, uh, as, they, as they take the podium. Uh, Representative Espaillat is uh, in Congress, it's in session today. And uh, I'm told that he's gonna be just three minutes late, so he's gonna be with us at 12.30. Um, so, um, so he's gonna join us uh, at 12.30, and when he comes on, I think we'll, uh, we'll first, uh, we'll, we'll talk with him about the legislation that he is uh, bringing in uh, to the House. He actually had legis similar legislation last year as well uh, uh, to abolish the federal death penalty very quickly just so that everyone understands let me let me ask you alexis if you can just explain to the audience quickly sort of the differences between the the federal death penalty i mean what does it mean to abolish the federal death penalty versus abolishing the death penalty and uh, and how do those go together just so that we understand i mean not all of us are have our hands in it uh, as much as 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 you and and kelly and everyone else um, alexis Sure. Um, and I lean heavily on some really fantastic uh, research that the Death Penalty Information Center has put together. And I really recommend that if folks are interested in learning more about the intricacies of our federal death system, in addition to the state system, to look at the Death Penalty Information Center. Uh, I believe it's deathpenaltyinfo.org. Um, that's DPIC. Uh, so the federal death penalty. And, and um, let me just it, add, uh, Robert Dunham, who uh, directs that, is hopefully going to be with us as well today, uh, joining us during the conversation. So yes, they do extraordinary work. And uh, thanks for, for adding that, Alexis. Go on. We, we also have a, a bunch of other folks who will be joining us as well. Ron Tabak, who was just involved, who's an attorney just at, uh, at Skadden, who was just involved with the uh, execution of Corey Johnson and others who will be joining us later during the, during the questions and, and conversation. Sorry, mm -hmm. the legal uh, lecture, Alexis. Yes, uh, the, the federal death penalty um, was really reintroduced um, in, the, in, the, in the recent past, so it's in the last about uh, 30, 30 years, 30 plus years. Um, and it allows the Department of Justice, which is our, our federal government, to seek the death penalty against an individual for a violation of federal law. In addition to the federal government, 28 states uh, still operate, still have on the books a state death penalty. So these are prosecutions that happen at the local level and it'll be a violation under state law. So out of those 28 states, we have three governors that have instituted moratoria. And so even though they still have the death penalty on the books, they're no longer carrying out executions and in some instances, no longer carrying out death prosecutions. But we still do have 25 states uh, that have uh, actively the death penalty. Um, and in total, there are around 2,500 individuals that have already been sentenced to death by state governments, local uh, prosecutor's offices, um, and often these are prosecutions done at the county level. 
Now with the federal death penalty, um, there must be some violation of federal law uh, that allows the Department of Justice, usually a, a, a United States assistant United States attorney to move forward with the prosecution. Most of the individuals uh, that are on federal death row, and they are currently um, 47, we're gonna get into the details of these 13 very recent executions. Um, but the 47 individuals, most of those crimes involve um, crossing state lines, which enacts and, and federalizes a, an otherwise aggravated murder. In some instances, it's a murder that has occurred on federal land sometimes in a federal um, prison facility, and that can enact the federal death penalty. And so when we think of uh, lay people, when we think of the worst of the worst crimes, we think maybe someone who has um, instituted a number of, uh, you know, serial killer, or those are not the type of crimes that are, that are really sought, the death penalty is sought after. It's, it's uh, um, Kelly Henry and I represent a young man who was 18 at the time of the crime and happened to cross state lines and yes, it was an aggravated murder that occurred, but in this instance, it was the federal government, the local US attorney's office that decided often and it's politically motivated, racially and politically motivated to go after an individual with the federal death penalty. Um, and of course, when the federal government is involved, our executive is the president. The, the chief prosecutor is the attorney general. Right. And again, it's the local United States attorneys. And so when we speak about the federal death penalty, Right now we have 47 individuals on death row. There are over 30 individuals where the government, federal government is seeking death. So these people are awaiting trial or they're in the midst of trials. And I also wanna remind um, everyone that's tuned in that the federal death penalty, that can happen anywhere in the United States. So even in New York, states like Michigan where there is no state death penalty, you still have the federal government that can and is in both of these states, New York and Michigan, seeking death against individuals for a violation of federal law. And so the representative of SBIOT will speak about pending federal legislation that will ideally abolish the federal death penalty. But we still have this battle at the state level. And I want to make, make that clear that that is a distinction. Even if we do abolish the federal death penalty, there is still the state death penalty and state by state, we must be working vigilantly on getting that off the table. Thank you, Alexis, uh, for that background. That really helps us to understand the difference between the federal death penalty legislation and these recent executions versus the state executions that have been going on and that continue to go on in Texas and Alabama and elsewhere. Um, Representative Espaillat, I see you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, I hope you're feeling well. Uh, I understand that uh, you unfortunately uh, were tested positive for the, for the COVID uh, yeah. virus um, right after the, uh, the the passage in the safe space at the uh, at the at the at Congress in Congress. Hmm? Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. I feel uh, good. I haven't uh, felt any symptoms. Uh, that means that the vaccine works because I had both of them. Although okay. the last one I had really like on the seventh, right, the day after the, okay. the insurrection. So wow. uh, it okay. didn't have the time to kick in, but. Uh, I felt good, no symptoms whatsoever, and uh, I encourage good. everybody to take the vaccine. Okay, uh, definitely, yeah. yes, yes. Let me quickly introduce well, you because I haven't had the time, I uh, haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. So, um, Representative Adriano Espaillat uh, uh, represents New York's 13 congressional district right here uh, uh, at Columbia. So we, uh, we 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 kind of we we are part of your. Uh, part of your constituency. Uh, Representative Espaillat is the first Dominican American to serve in the US House of Representatives. Uh, he was uh, first elected in Congress in 2016 and is serving his third term in Congress now. Uh, he currently serves as a member of the uh, US uh, House uh, Committee on Appropriations, which is of course very influential. He's a member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus where he serves in a leadership role as the second vice chair and he's a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, where he serves as Deputy Whip. Representative Espaillat also serves as a Senior Whip of the Democratic Caucus. And most importantly today, on this historic day uh, that I was talking about, on, uh, on January 15, 2021, Representative Espaillat introduced the Federal Death Penalty Act of 2021 to repeal 
uh, and abolish uh, the federal death penalty. I was saying it's a historic day, uh, Representative Espaya today, because actually it's the first day that in this country that a president of the United States uh, is sitting in the White House opposed to the death penalty. This is the, actually the first day we've ever had a sitting president who is an abolitionist and wants to abolish the death penalty. So tell us a little bit about the legislation you've passed and give us a little bit of the background. I know you've been trying before to pass this legislation and, uh, and here we are in a different moment and in a different time. Yes, so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak about this very important piece of legislation. Let me just give you a history, a little bit about uh, my opposition to, to the death penalty. It goes back uh, to my college days when I did, I, I, I completed a term paper on the death penalty. And, and I did extensive research, read a book called Albion's Fatal Tree and other books that spoke about uh, the whole history of the death penalty and, and that the, the injustices that are sort of like dragged by that very uh, archaic Byzantine uh, policy, right? Uh, and how uh, racist it was in scope and how discriminatory it was in scope and how uh, you know, innocent uh, folks were were put uh, on death road, and uh, as a result, it got me involved in a bunch of cases that weren't even some of them weren't even death penalty cases, but wrongful conviction cases. I was involved with the Innocent Project and the Fernando Bermudez case, uh, a, a young man who served 15, 18 years for uh, a crime that he did not commit, a murder that he did did not commit and was eventually released from jail. Uh, and so my involvement in doing a criminal justice reform and alternative to incar uh, incarceration uh, um, uh, prior to being involved in politics was sort of like the background of why I'm so committed and engaged in this uh, campaign to abolish the death penalty. And of course, uh, once I got to Congress, uh, I introduced legislation to abolish it. Uh, last, last session, it had as many as 67 sponsors, uh, co-sponsors. Uh, and if you take the uh, Presley legislation, uh, there was a total of 90 members of Congress that uh, supported uh, one or the other legislation. Uh, there is... Uh, a similar bill in the Senate uh, introduced by Senator Durbin. And so there is traction in Congress to abolish it. And, and I think it's important because as you said, we have now a sitting president that philosophically stands uh, against the death penalty. And uh, it's important to push not just to get, for example, some executive orders or, or moratorium on it or to rescind the protocol, the federal execution protocol, or withdraw current death warrants or hold pending cases or stop cases that currently uh, uh, will warrant the death penalty or instruct DOJ attorney generals uh, or assistant attorneys to not get involved in, in these types of cases. I think those are good things. And maybe as a starter, those are things that we can push the administration to do. But I think the goal will be to codify it, right? To ensure that we pass legislation that will abolish it once and for all. Mm -hmm. And I think that will require, obviously, uh, uh, several uh, strategies, uh, political strategies, because there may be a reluctance from leadership to take that issue to the floor, right? Mm -hmm. Because in many cases, they may feel that some, even our rank and file members may not be ready uh, to take a vote on that. So I think we need leadership from the White House to make sure that we take a look at the rest of the world and how uh, we are in such uh, like difficult company with regards to this issue and, and when you consider the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and to make it almost uh, a common practice uh, for everybody, even at the dinner table, to, to reject it. Uh, to have the church and religious uh, entities behind us, to have uh, community groups and advocates behind us, to have uh, folks uh, that maybe may even from across the aisle 
who may disagree with us uh, dramatically uh, on other issues, but may agree with us on this one. There is a tendency for Republicans to be uh, now advocates of uh, criminal justice reform in other areas, right? right? Mandatory minimums and mass incarceration issues. So how do we capture their support uh, to make sure that we create a climate where leadership uh, from our end feels comfortable that this is an issue that we can bring to the floor mm -hmm. that members uh, may not have to take a difficult vote on. So uh, this is the challenge and I'm up to the task. Uh, I'm gonna need your help from both the academic and grassroots perspective. And we're working hard to make sure that the Biden administration particularly since we saw this rash of executions, you know, in the last, as, as the, the Trump administration faced uh, a storm of uh, criticism after the insurgency and a sort of like a, a, a question of legitimacy, they still went ahead and executed Corey Johnson and Alyssa Montgomery and Dustin Hicks. And there was a rash of last minute executions as they, they exited. And, so I don't think enough attention was paid to it, although we did get some traction, but I think it should have been louder that uh, this guy who's not who, who launched a criminal act on Congress, who was a perpetrator surrounded by predicate felons like, like uh, Rudy Giuliani, who led another riot in front of City Hall against Mayor Dinkins, uh, right. was killing people, was right. executing people as he left Left the room. So we must uh, continue to, to fight, uh, to codify this. And, and for starters, we should be asking them to, to halt it and to bring forward all the best practices to ensure that it doesn't happen again under his watch. Right. Thank yeah. you so much for having what me. Is, uh, tell us, tell us uh, Representative Espet, what's the, what, do you, what do you think is the timing on this uh, in terms of- I've already, I've already introduced the bill. I Right. And, I know if, I'm, if I'm if I'm correct, uh, I think in a recent uh, press conference, uh, the Biden administration was asked about it, and uh, it seems that they're looking at it themselves, right? Right. And so the fact that we already know that he's against it and that his people are looking at it is a good uh, start in us engaging them in the discussion to see what are the first steps that they should take. And then what are the, the, the longer uh, uh, steps that we should take to codify it? I think it's important that we abolish it, not just that we implement the moratorium or best practices to stop the, the executions, but to outlaw it once and for all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Terrific, terrific. We have today on our panel, <clears throat> some extraordinary people who have been doing so much work on this. I don't know if you know Kelly Henry, who was representing Lisa Montgomery, um, yes. and, uh, and of course Liliana Segura, who was at all of those uh, executions reporting, uh, doing terrific reporting on that, as well as Susanna Sheffer, who works a lot with the families of persons who've been executed, and Alexis Hogue, who is a uh, death penalty attorney and, and scholar, and Mrs. Greenwood, uh, Ms. Lee, Lee Greenwood, whose son was uh, executed in Texas yes. back in 2007. Any, any- well, One of the things that we should ask immediately for is the dismantlement of the execution chamber. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's dismantle that. That is the, the, the tool that they use to execute people. Let's get rid of it so that they won't be able to ever again uh, uh, execute anybody. So that's one of the, right. the issues that we should uh, that is basically like a low hanging fruit, if you may. Right, right, right. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having us. I understand Congress is in session and you have to get back to uh, have to get your back to uh, duties. Sorry, I was a little late. I was, you know, we were discussing immigration reform and I'm going to be part of a team that's going to be engaging the administration in uh, that great issue too. So uh, thank you for having Excellent. me and I wish you all the very best. Thank you, uh, and we wish you all the very best, and we're here to help, so tell us how, and we will. I appreciate it, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, that's really, in, in a way, that's, that's all the news that's fit to print on this first historic day uh, of, uh, of an abolitionist president with legislation uh, that's been introduced in the House and in the Senate by uh, Dick Durbin of Illinois. Uh, this is really a historic moment when we need to step up 
and uh, and support these efforts. Um, now, what we're going to be we're going to start our conversation though before we're kind of returning to this recent uh, uh, horrific uh, spree of federal executions in this lame in in a lame duck period. I mean, unimaginable horror uh, in this country. But we need to step back a little bit and understand what is what I consider to be the the the, the hidden and one of the most devastating aspects of the death penalty, um, which is its impact on the families, the children, the, the daughters, the sons, the mothers, the fathers, the brothers, the sisters, and all the extended family of persons who are um, executed or, or, or who are sitting on death row awaiting execution. This is, I think, one of the aspects about the death penalty that goes kind of, that, that, that hasn't received as much attention, uh, for instance, as, as issues of innocence, which of course, uh, sentencing someone to prison or to death or, or executing an innocent person is of course uh, horrid, um, or, or, or the problems with methods of execution, and lethal injection, or the problems of ineffective assistance of counsel that we see in so many cases. The one issue I think that really we haven't, we haven't come to grasp or we haven't understood properly, in part because we, we often don't see it and we don't hear it, is the effect of the death penalty on all of the people who are involved in this machinery of death. Um, and so to, to start to help us to understand that, uh, we've invited Susanna Sheffer, who's a licensed uh, clinical mental health counselor and a writer and researcher, uh, focusing on the impact of the death penalty on families. Um, uh, Susanna was formerly of the um, uh, Murder Victims Families for Human Rights, and she recently wrote the, uh, this report that we've put on our website, which you should really read. Uh, it's the report of the Texas After Violence Project from 2019 called Nobody to Talk to, Barriers to Mental Health Treatment for Family Members of Individuals Sentenced to Death or Executed. And she's spoken about these issues at a variety of venues, including the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights at the United Nations in 2016. And we're really thrilled to have uh, Susanna here to really help us understand these issues, as well as to have with us uh, Lee Greenwood, uh, who is the mother of Joseph Nichols, uh, who was executed by the state of Texas uh, on March 7, 2007. Uh, we are all so sorry for your loss, uh, Ms. Greenwood. Uh, Ms. Greenwood has shared her story with the Texas After Violence Project and, and discusses uh, Joseph, uh, her son's life, his friends, uh, his, uh, his giving character, and the injustices they suffered at the hands of the Texas criminal legal system. But let me start with you, Susanna, and then maybe also you can engage and, and bring in uh, Ms. Greenwood. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this work you've been doing, this vital work you've been doing, of trying to understand the harms and deal with the trauma associated with uh, executions and the death penalty. Yes, thank you so much, Bernard. And, and just as you were saying, here we are four and a half decades since reinstatement of the death penalty in the United States and still the harmful impact of death sentences and executions on anyone other than the individual offender is just not widely recognized and not even among mental health professionals who specialize in responding after trauma so again, as you were saying that, yeah, the debate about whether the death penalty is or is not an appropriate punishment for someone who is guilty of murder doesn't take into account adequately that the death penalty as a practice harms a whole range of people who have not been accused or convicted of any crime. So also, I think as you were beginning to, to suggest, it's true that in recent years, there's been a small amount of research and writing about how the practice of the death penalty affects some other groups like prison guards, for example, and chaplains and jurors, and the three groups that my own work has focused on, families of murder victims who are assumed to be in favor of the death penalty and who are told that it will help them even though it's only available in a comparatively small percentage of murder cases, and who can face discrimination and denial of their legal rights if they oppose the death penalty. Capital defense attorneys who are working on cases where loss means loss of their client's life, as you all know, and who feel themselves to be standing between their clients and the execution. That's a direct quote from an attorney I interviewed, and so who suffer their own traumatic impact when clients are executed. And the focus of today's discussion, family members of individuals who've been sentenced to death or executed. And 
that group of family members has mostly been so unrecognized and even unimagined that they've been referred to by one researcher as hidden victims. So one of the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder is witnessing or even just learning about actual or threatened violent death of a family member. And an execution does meet the definition of violent death because it's a death that's deliberately caused by the actions of another person or person. So living with a family member who's under a death sentence includes all the stresses of a family member's incarceration plus the continued threat of death. And that threat can persist over many years, sometimes with repeated cycles of the execution almost happening and then not happening and then almost happening again. And all of that, and then of course, the execution itself can affect family members in ways that impact and change their minds and their bodies. Trauma is a public health issue as much as it's anything else because repeated experience of trauma can be as harmful and debilitating as any chronic illness. Losing a family member to execution is in some ways like losing a family member to homicide. And by the way, some death certificates after an execution list the cause of death as homicide. But of course, it's also different, right? Because the perpetrator is the that more abstract entity, the state, and the death is publicly and actively desired by others. So family members will talk about the experience of seeing people cheering for their loved one's death. Kenneth Doka introduce a concept called disenfranchised grief to the psychological literature in 1989. And he wasn't using it to refer to the experience of family members of executed persons, but it's so apt that it's as if the phrase was invented for that purpose. So just real quickly, Adoka's disenfranchised grief refers to instances where the bereaved are denied the right to grieve by society. He says, when a loss cannot be openly acknowledged, publicly mourned or socially supported, healing is much harder than it would be otherwise. So here's the voice of an adult daughter of an executed man. This is something she said to me in an interview. And she said, quote, his execution is something I have to deal with emotionally by myself. People say it doesn't matter. He got what he deserved. If you try to tell somebody about your story, people say, I don't even understand why you feel bad. And here's just one more quote from a different daughter of another executed man. She says, why couldn't we have had someone to help us through it? When we walked in the courtroom, people gave us dirty looks just because we belong to our father. People look at it like the whole family must be bad. So that question that she asks, why couldn't we have had somebody to help us through it? There are valid critiques that, to be made about the provision of victim services in this country. That's a topic for another day, but there's nothing even remotely equivalent available for family members of the condemned. No official recognition, no formal provision of services. And interestingly, just as a sort of quick aside, the issue of families of the executed has actually gotten more attention and recognition within the international human rights community than here in the US. So back in 2013, the UN Human Rights Council resolved to study the issue of children of parents sentenced to death or executed. And they called that a humanitarian and human rights issue that has received little attention. And then as, as you were mentioning, the issue was acknowledged again at an office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights event in 2016. And there, several of the delegates who made comments from the floor at that event referred to the harmful impact that children and other relatives of persons sentenced to death or executed experience. So that was notable. That was an awareness there that I haven't seen in public forums in the US. And it's interesting that even some retentionist countries, you know, in other words, countries that still have the death penalty have acknowledged that it makes sense to take note of the adverse impact that the death penalty has on children of those sentenced to death or executed, and you maybe even to try to provide some assistance. So we hope, of course, here today that drawing attention to the impact that the death penalty has on others could help persuade people to abolish the death penalty. But even before we succeed at abolishing the death penalty, we shouldn't wait to address the harm that it causes. You know, indeed you could say that as long as we carry out this practice, we're all the more obligated to address the harm. As, as you all heard, I'm here representing the Texas After Violence Project, which is an oral history documentation project that aims to look at the effect of the death penalty on everybody else, on individuals and families and communities. And at TAVP, our focus right now is on achieving formal recognition for family members of individuals who've been sentenced to death or executed. And when I say formal recognition, 
I mean, essentially recognition that this is a group who have experienced a trauma that counts right alongside other experiences of trauma. And a little over a year ago, we released that report called Nobody to Talk To, which focused on barriers to mental health treatment for family members of individuals who've been sentenced to death or executed. And we're continuing to work now to make mental health services accessible to those family members who want them. And we are encouraged by interest from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, with whom we're going to be collaborating to develop educational materials. They acknowledge that they had never thought about the needs of this population, but are ready to think with us now. And by some interest too from within clinical training programs, these are small steps, but to us, they're enormous in their implications just because there's been no attention or recognition up to this point. So I'll just end by telling you all that in 2005, I helped to organize a press conference and public remembrance ceremony of family members of executed persons. As far as we know, it was the first public event like that ever. We brought family members from around the country together for this. And afterward, one of the participants whose brother had been executed some years before talked about the power of that occasion of public recognition. And she said, quote, you want other people to know that you're human and your people were human and you love them too. And in that comment, I hear the way in which it's not just the family's grief that has been disenfranchised, but the entire experience of having a family member sentenced to death and then executed. If prison exiles a person from society, execution, of course, does so even more profoundly, both literally and symbolically. And it can exile the surviving family members emotionally as well. So the call today is for the opposite of exile, inclusion and recognition. And that means recognizing the commonality of their suffering so that family members of people who've been sentenced to death or executed can be you know, sort of counted among the larger group of trauma survivors and can avail themselves of whatever resources are available, including mental health services, if that's what's desired. But I think that call today also means recognizing the singular aspects of this experience and not blurring the distinctions too much, not only lumping this in with like, for example, the larger group of families of people who are incarcerated, but instead understanding all the ways in which this is a particular kind of loss, mm -hmm. a very particular kind of sorrow that is not exactly like any other. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. I think everything you're saying is really hitting nerves, I know, for probably everyone on this panel. Yeah. But, um, I mean, it just makes me remember a time in, in uh, 1999, what a trial where, I mean, and this is one of the, those things that marks you the most in a way. Um, when uh, my client, uh, Philip Tomlin, who wrote a post for us on the website here so you can read from philip Tomlin. but when he was sentenced to death judicial override over a unanimous live verdict um and uh and i remember that the most damaging thing was really um helping his daughter joy you know deal with uh this uh this was for him the fourth time he was sentenced to death actually but helping her deal with that moment i think was probably one of the most difficult things I was not capable of doing, um, but it was precisely um, the, 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 the damage that was inflicted there on her was just so traumatic. Yeah. And, and it's what you deal with all the time, right? Well, I, I'm gonna turn now to Lee Greenwood who, who has personally lived the experience that, that we've been referring to here. And so, Lee, uh, you know, as, as we discussed, I'll, I'll just start you off by asking a couple of questions. And so how have you been affected by your son's execution? And, you know, what was it like for you at the time? And then what's it like now, all these years later? And uh, let me see, M Ms. Greenwood, you're gonna need to try to unmute the computer there. And let's see how the sound is with the Houston storm going on. Go ahead. Are you able to hear me now? Marvelously, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for inviting me to uh, such a wonderful panel group. And um, Susanna, um, thank you for the efforts that you have and have been doing 
uh, to recognize those of us that have lost our loved ones as well as those that were affected on the other side. Uh, it is most refreshing to hear of uh, the planned um, things that you have and those that you have put in place. Let me say first, it's something that you live with daily. Uh, you find a place in your heart and mind to put it so that you're able to function and from day to day and live with the heartache that it brings. There is not, I believe, a hurt like the loss of a child. I have lost both my mother and my father, and the hurt was not as great. They were well in their years, and they had lived good lives, but to see or have a loved one or a child, especially uh, lost in this manner, is very, very heart-wrenching. Over the years, um, I have met various ones that were in the same uh, predicament I was, and I call it a predicament because that it, that's exactly what it is because you never think of yourself being in that position or predicament. Uh, I think it has to, it's dealt with individually. I think that, uh, and these are only my thoughts, that um, everyone has a way that they find to deal with it, some not as well as others. Uh, I have experienced, uh, been acquainted with those that have um, had very, oh, shall I say, experiences that were very much detrimental to their day-to-day -day living after the fact. I know of two women that I can think of at this time that week or two after the demise of their loved one, they passed away. I can only think maybe it was from heartbreak or from things that uh, were brought on by such a harsh sentence and the carrying out of said sentence, uh, something that they were not able to live with. And uh, we are all human and we can only stand so much. Yes. Uh, my children, uh, they deal with it individually. As far as uh, my thoughts are, I have to remain strong so that they can uh, withstand the trauma that comes from it. Once your children see that you are not taking it very well, it has a distinct effect on them. So. Mothers, as mothers do, remain as strong as they can publicly. Now, I have had my moments where I may go into a, uh, a room that's secluded and have a 15-minute nervous breakdown but uh, or in the backyard with a loud scream, but this is my way of coping with it. Mm. Yeah, and, you know, when, I remember that when you told your story to the Texas After Violence Project and you were talking about your other children, you, you said that Joseph's execution damaged all of them, that, that there's a suffering for the siblings. And I, you know, you mentioned that just now, I wonder if you can say a little more about that, about you know, how the other kids suffered, how they were harmed, were there questions that they asked? Well, since they um, were, I had no real small children. Joseph uh, was sentenced uh, in his early 20s. So the other children were, uh, say, teenagers or uh, some of them had become adults. Joseph was number three, and I have five children. They dealt with it individually on the, in their own way. Of course, being a close-knit family, uh, we do a lot of hugging, and uh, we speak of him often. There, I believe, it was not a day that goes by that someone in the family does not refer to him as how, to how he was or how he would think about uh, a sit particular situation. So we just kind of band together and supported each other. Mm -hmm. I do know that my daughter sought, count sought counseling, and it has helped her tremendously to deal with it because, of course, you always ask yourself why. And I remember asking Joseph that at one point and saying, why is all of this happening to us? He simply said, Mother, uh, it happens to other people. Why not us? It does not uh, make us exempt from adverse things that happen in your lives, and you have no control over that uh, 
So that was comforting. And he was strengthening to all of us by the strength that he showed. Yes. And you mentioned, is a bit that you come to know other mothers or other family members of people on death row in Texas, or maybe people whose sons have already been executed. And what have you seen this in terms of how they're affected or, or maybe some don't have the kind of support that you felt that you had? I'm curious what you've seen in, in others. There have been others that I've known, and some of us still stay in contact with each other because we've kind of formed, a, shall I say, a sisterhood just to support each other. Uh, I do know of one person over the years that uh, she was from a small town, and the whole town, everyone that she knew and did not know seemed to ostracize her. Uh, she couldn't even go to the grocery store. And persons that she felt like were friends would say, how could you raise a child to do such a thing? Uh, I did not experience that. Those persons that were my friends were my friends and were supportive of me and the family. Um, they simply asked, what can we do to help you? Or what can we do to help? Some simply said, I don't know what to say. Just know that I'm here. What does help? What can people do to help? There's not... I don't think there's really anything they can do to help, except what those that I knew and those that were friends and family members of mine that said, we are here if you need us for whatever you need us for. Just call us. That's a help. Mm -hmm. They cannot in no way know the stress or the strain or the feelings that you have or experience what you're experiencing, except those that are in the same uh, situation that you are, yes. but just knowing that there is someone there that is willing to listen without prejudice and to listen without uh, laying blame or just not saying anything, just listen. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And well, so uh, because execution is, is such a particular way to lose somebody, it's, it's something that you know, so many have not experienced. I'm wondering, speaking to people who have not gone through what you have, what do you wish people understood? You know, what, maybe what do people not get or what do, you, what do you wish people would understand about what this is like? I have uh, experienced meeting so many people that do not seem to grasp the fact that it can happen to you also. Mm -hmm. You never think that, oh, and I've heard persons say, and they have said to me, oh, that won't happen to me. That won't happen to my family. You need to understand that it will and it can. Yes. Is there any last thoughts, if there's anything I haven't asked that you would like to add? No, there's nothing that you have not asked that I would like to add at this point. Of course, after the... Um, conference uh, the, uh, is over, I'll think of a million things as it usually goes. But uh, I thank you again for the efforts that you're putting forth to um, shine the light on the group that I stand in, as well as on the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. There has not been, to my knowledge, anything or any kind of support formally uh, for persons that have experienced um, a family member being executed. Now, here in Houston, there are small pockets of uh, abolition uh, efforts that uh, have been put together through the years. Uh, there's one group that comes to mind, the Texas Death Penalty Abolition uh, uh, Movement. Uh, and these are persons that know of families, and uh, they will, uh, I can remember once on Joseph's uh, birthday month, which is September, at the same resting place, there were two other uh, persons that had been laid to rest that had been executed. And um, there was a candlelight ceremony, mm -hmm. uh, just a group of people that got together to commemorate those people mm -hmm. and to say, hey, we still remember you and your plight. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thank you again for what you're doing 
And Bernard, I thank you for putting this group together and for uh, inviting me to be a part of it. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Greenwood. Thank you so much. Um, I know you're going to stay with us, so um, we're going to come back to you in the in the in the in the conversation that we'll have in a moment. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that with us, and 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 thank you, Susanna, uh, so much for for facilitating, but also for presenting this in its in its appropriate context, and for all that you do. Uh, so much that you said was. Uh, so triggering in a way, um, but there's this idea that, you know, one's, one's loved one would be executed with people outside cheering it on, right, is something that is simply hard to imagine, right? And so thank you, Mrs. Greenwood, for, for sharing uh, with us. Um, and we will continue uh, that conversation. Of course, another piece of both the the harm and the need to abolish the death penalty is, is lawyering, litigating these cases and, uh, and living through that experience and, uh, and, having, to, uh, and having to go through it uh, to the bitter end. Um, so we have with us uh, Kelly Henry and we're so thankful that you're joining us today um, under such kind of raw time uh, one week uh, after the execution of Lisa Montgomery. Um, uh, Kelly Henry is the chief of the Federal Public Defender Capital Habeas Unit in Nashville, Tennessee, and she's represented individuals on death row for over three decades. Uh, she was the lead counsel in the 2018 challenge to Tennessee's uh, new lethal injection protocol and uh, she's the recipient of the 2019 American Bar Association Death Penalty Representation Project, Justice John Paul Stevens Guiding Hand of Counsel Award. Uh, as we all know, uh, most recently, uh, she along with other attorneys uh, in her office, Lisa Nori and Amy Harwell, uh, represented Lisa Montgomery, uh, who was the only woman on federal death row and uh, who was executed on January 13, 2021. Uh, thanks again, Kelly, for joining us. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this from your own experience, um, uh, what it is like and, and, and what it has been like uh, com combating these uh, federal executions and the, and the killing spree that just happened? Well, thank you so much for inviting me and allowing me to talk about Lisa Montgomery. And I will say one other um, thing that I'm very proud of is I'm also the parent of a Columbia sophomore, Chazzy Bailey. So just shout out to my, my young man. Um, you know, I'm so pleased to be here today and proud to talk about Lisa, even though it is hard. Yesterday was so bittersweet. Um, many of you who followed the case know that Lisa had a calendar that she kept when she was on suicide watch that ended on January 20th. Mm. And, you know, the fact that we couldn't get her eight more days is something that haunts me. But yesterday watching all of the inauguration festivities, I really am taking to heart what President Biden said when he's talked about how it's time to be bold, right? It's time to be bold. And that means it's time to ask for abolition, not just a moratorium. It's time to ask for President Biden to clear the row. Because quite frankly, the federal death penalty is a failed government program that costs the taxpayers thousands of dollars. Millions of dollars, I'm sorry. But when I think about Lisa Montgomery, you know, she was executed on the 13th, the day that President Trump was impeached. The week before, on January the 6th, as the mob was climbing the steps of the Capitol, I was presenting Lisa's clemency case to the Office of Pardon Attorney. Mm -hmm. I literally saw the mob as I turned on the WebEx to mm -hmm. begin and to be asking this panel to ask President Trump to save her life. And there's a bit of um, delusional thinking that comes over you as an attorney. Um, you think that these contacts you have, the people who reach out to you, all of the stuff you have going on behind the scenes. We have people talking to Ivanka Trump. We have people talking to Charles Kushner. Um, 
and you think if you make this compelling case, it will make a difference. And, you know, it, it was just surreal. It was just surreal. I mean, we had one of the pardon attorneys was crying during our presentation. Um, and, you know, I, I think as people saw, we had four states of execution. We had a Trump judge find that Lisa was likely incompetent to be executed. And we had one after one of those stays lifted. Altogether, we had 12 judges who said that there were legal issues in Lisa's case that deserved to be heard. But what happened in that killing spree, that bloodlust that happened during the last six months of the Trump administration was that law didn't matter anymore. Truth and justice didn't matter anymore. And anyone who tried to stand in the way between the government and their client was you know, slandered by the government in their pleadings. Um, my co-counsel and I both got COVID because they chose to set Lisa's execution during a pandemic. And because we had to choose between our own health and our obligation to our client. And then when we got sick and we were very sick, the government suggested that we were faking. I mean, just the height of that hypocrisy that they put us in that position and then accused us of lying. They put Lisa under conditions that were like Guantanamo because they chose to set her execution date, knowing that it would make her become incompetent. The first thing we did was try to improve her conditions. And we told them, if you don't improve her conditions, you know, they, they had men watching her use the bathroom. This is a woman who was a gang rape survivor. They put her in a suicide smock and didn't allow her underwear. She had intrusive nightmares. They kept the light on all night. We said, if you don't fix this, she is going to become irrational. We did everything we could to keep Lisa from becoming incompetent to be executed. But we warned them, if you don't improve the way you're keeping her, it's going to happen. And Lisa struggled to maintain her sanity. You know, we had people suggesting to us that she should stop taking her meds, tell her just to stop taking her meds. And I had this conversation with my husband about, you know, how can I ethically tell my client to stop taking her medication? Mm -hmm. And he said, what, you're supposed to torture her too? You know, and the fact of the matter is it wasn't even an issue because Lisa fought to maintain her sanity the entire time she was on death watch. Mm -hmm. And when she did finally become incompetent, we immediately went to court, but we were the ones accused of waiting too long. It's always the defense attorney who's to blame. I uh, told a grassroots organizer once as a death penalty lawyer, I feel like a battered wife because I'm blamed for doing what I'm supposed to do for my client. And when my client gets executed, you know, then as it happened to me last week, when I asked a court to pause, give me a one week continuance of a hearing that was supposed to, ha that did happen in Memphis on Tuesday, because I needed some time to heal. The response is, you know, you're a lawyer, get into court. You know, you, you, you're not supposed to feel, you're not supposed to care about your clients. And the last thing I want to talk about, because I know we're, we're definitely short on time and there's so many important um, things to talk about, but Ms. Greenwood really um, struck a chord for me and, and Suzanne did as well about the way that family members of our clients are treated. You know, in the federal system, the victim's family members travel is paid for. The media interviews after are limited to the family members of the victims. And it is orchestrated in such a way that the media has to choose between going to the media center and getting the, the story of what actually happened or talking to the defense attorneys and talking to um, the client's family members. They don't get a voice. Their voice is silenced mm -hmm. in the most cruel way. And they can't even get, you know, our clients are often poor. Their families are poor. So if their lawyers or abolitionists don't pay their way to Terre Haute, they can't even be there for their loved one's murder at the hands of the state. 
they are treated so cruelly and insensitively by our government and offered no counseling whatsoever after, only what they can get from the love of the, of the defense team. And this is after, of course, we had Lisa's sister, Diane, who put herself out there, who told her trauma story, who triggered herself telling the story of what happened to her, the, her rape as a child, to save her sister's life, only to be told her story didn't matter. To once again be told, you don't matter. It's such an injustice what we do to these family members. And um, mm. yeah, I mean, I just, I thank you so much for the boldness of this convening because it is time to abolish the federal death penalty and mm. to clear the road. Mm. Thank you so much, Kelly. I mean, you know, as you, as you speak and when it's just the arbitrariness of the death penalty, which of course we've all been, we've all been litigating and fighting about for years. But if anyone doesn't understand how arbitrary this death penalty is in, in, in the face of the execution of Lisa Montgomery, uh, and, and the other, uh, Corey Johnson and the final executions, which were literally a day, a two, two days away from the transfer of power to an administration that was not going to execute, right? I mean, if, if ever there was a definition of what is arbitrary and capricious uh, or cruel and unusual, it is just the, the, the fact that just an accident is what is the difference between life and death. Just an accident, just a, just a, just a, you know, a slight delay. A court deciding to read the briefs, for instance, uh, would make the difference between life and death. And I have to say, this bloodlust you you spoke of so powerfully, and also bringing in the what 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 uh, what is inflicted on the families, and and you're so right about the way. And we're going to turn to that with Liliana, particularly about the way that everything is orchestrated in this way to kind of exclude um, members of the process who are uh, and of on the same footing as anyone else. Right? Uh, it's just it's just so uh, cruel and such bloodlust. But I'll have to say, I mean, particularly in in Lisa's case, I mean, I don't like saying this because, you know, we appear before these courts and whatnot, but look, three circuit courts impose stays, three separate United States courts of appeals representing, I mean, representing the, 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 the pinnacle of the judiciary, including an en banc panel I mean, all, a majority of the DC circuit, the most respected jurists in the country, right? Three separate circuits, they all are imposing a stay and it's a majority of the Supreme Court that is, is, is lifting these stays one after another. I mean, it, it seems as if the Supreme Court has just become the nation's executioner. You know, and the thing about it is, is that each of those stays was based on a legal claim that could not have been brought before the execution date was set. The government creates the emergency and then blames the attorneys and the defendant for bringing these quote unquote last minute claims. When in fact, no claim that we brought was ripe until the execution date was set. And as we know, elections have consequences and you know, six to three. Right. You know, six to three. And as Justice Sotomayor said, you know, this was not justice. Yeah, yeah. Crazy, crazy. Arbitrariness at its most, at its greatest. Um, thank you, Kelly. And thank you for all the work you do and have done and for joining us after this, uh, in this, in this raw moment. Thank you. Um, Liliana, let's, let's turn to you um, because uh, just as Kelly was talking about the way in which this is orchestrated and what it's like to be at Terre Haute and to be a journalist there. Uh, Liliana Segura is an award-winning investigative journalist who covers uh, US criminal justice uh, system, long time focus on harsh sentencing, on the death penalty, wrongful convictions. Uh, Liliana is a senior editor at The Intercept, 
uh, and her work there has earned the Texas Gavel Award and the Innocence Network Journalism Award. Uh, she's reported on every single execution carried out uh, by the Trump administration. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about you know, this, this the, the, the role of the journalist and, uh, and the way in which everything is kind of uh, set up uh, at Terre Haute. Sure, I'd be happy to. I, uh, I just wanna start, well, thank you for including me in this discussion. It's really an honor, it's very humbling. And uh, everyone who's spoken um, has really touched a nerve. I think my nerves are very raw from having come home from Terre Haute and I'm still trying to process and distill what I saw not only in the past week, but um, over the past several months and beyond. And my first trip to Terre Haute was actually in the fall of 2019 as I geared up to try to tell these stories. Uh, little did I know that I'd be doing this reporting in the midst of a pandemic and that we'd see the kind of um, incredible uh, killing spree that we ended up seeing. So, so I just wanna thank you all for, for including me in this and, and, and to Kelly, uh, especially, you know, who's my neighbor here in Nashville. Uh, um, you know, I've seen her um, working in these trenches for, for years now. Um, I've been thinking as she spoke about uh, my coverage of Cynthia Vaughn, who's, who's, whose father was um, executed here in Tennessee some years back, whose mother was the victim in that case, so she lost both her parents um, it, uh, and um, what a loss that represented. And, and, and Bernard, I, I met you, I think, through the when I re first reported about um, your client, uh, Doyle Lee Ham, and I talked to his brother, um, and he described for me the way in which he was waiting in a van as the state of Alabama tried to start, uh, tried to put in the, the, the uh, lines to kill his brother, and, and, and that ended up being a botch, an execution that didn't ultimately uh, succeed because Doyle. Uh, became one of those handful of people who who survived his execution I and mean, what a torturous trauma that was for everyone and for you as well so um so i have a lot coming up for as i listen to you all and i and i just um bear with me as i try to collect my thoughts um so as a journalist i guess well like i said i we all knew everyone on this call knew uh th that when trump was elected we would see there would be a moment where where this became uh you know real where um it was one of my first thoughts was uh, we're gonna see a return to federal executions. And as a journalist, you know, I sort of wanted to anticipate this moment and I got in touch with um, a couple of people, some activists, some attorneys sort of to be like, hey, I wanna start writing about this. Like, what should I, what should I, where should I start? And, and pretty quickly it became clear that this was not something that necessarily, people necessarily wanted in that moment, kind of like, hold off, you know, everyone sort of needed to get their strategies in place and, and, and maybe it wasn't time to kind of poke the bear, which I understand, I've come to understand why, the, and, and, and it took quite a long time for the death machinery to start up. Um, and by the time it finally did, um, I tried to get organized, tried to hit the ground running um, and very quickly discovered, um, I don't think I'd covered the federal system very often. I hadn't had that much to do with the Bureau of Prisons. Um, but one of the first things I did was write to the Bureau of Prisons uh, sort of, you know, PR line um, and say, hey, I'm going to be traveling to Terre Haute. You know, initially the first rounds of executions, they were supposed to take place in December and January um, 2019 to 2020. So I made it clear that I intended to be there, that I wanted to be on whatever list they put together, that I wanted to kind of, you know, I apply to be a witness when the time came. And it was like, just dealing with, it was like I was shouting into a void. I never got, I got all these responses that were like, oh yeah, great, sure. Like, we'll let you know, we'll let you know. And I think, my emails, I think I emailed them like every month from July to the fall, I think finally in November, about a month out, um, I was like, what's going on? You know, I haven't gotten any information about what it means to try to report, and it, you know, at all. And I was told after months of being told, um, oh, we'll let you know, we'll let you know. I was told actually, um, there's not gonna be a, a, a media area on the grounds and we've already selected our witnesses which was truly bizarre. Um, I, at no point had I been told what the procedure was for, for uh, requesting to be a media witness. Uh, there was no form online, now there is, or more recently there is. Um, so that was my introduction to the, the bizarro world of trying to cover these executions. Um, when those executions were stayed, um, I went ahead and went to Terre Haute anyway. I went in December to try to, I wanted to try to get to know this place, uh, try to meet some of the activists on the ground who, who were um, planning to be around, be in Terre Haute, um, standing in opposition to the executions. And so um, fast forward to July, uh, you know, when, when the executions finally did start, um, as you know, there were three in one week. Um, and that week was incredibly chaotic, incredibly, uh, 
traumatic for a lot of people. I mean, I'll never forget, um, you know, all the sort of legal back and forth in that first execution of, uh, of Danny, uh, Danny Lee, you know, which, which came after midnight. Uh, we all thought uh, that, that it, shouldn't, it wouldn't be able to move forward because in our experience, the execution warrant, the death warrant expires at midnight. We didn't understand that the federal government was just gonna go ahead and, and push this through. And so um, this whole experience has been like trying to learn the rules of a system that's kind of making it up as it goes along, uh, frankly, uh, as a journalist and I'm sure, you know, for legal teams as well. Um, um, I didn't, I, I never actually was approved as a media witness. I did end up applying um, many, many times. Not every time. I, there were times I was too concerned, frankly, about COVID um, and what I would, was hearing from, from witnesses. Um, uh, I will say that when I finally did kind of uh, reach a person who explained to me, you know, who sent me the link to apply online, um, uh, I asked I asked, it was very important to me to know whether the media center was going to be inside or outside because I knew that indoor transmission uh, carries a higher risk uh, of, uh, of COVID. And I was told it would be, I would be outside. You will be outside. So I was like, oh, well, maybe it's like a setup like in the parking lot, kind of like at Riverbend in Tennessee, there's like you're outside in this kind of media tent, you know, maybe it's that kind of thing. No, <laughs> you know, you show up as a journalist at the, at the training center as it's called. Um, and it's non-witnessing press. It's a really bizarre setup because essentially they put all the media witnesses in one room um, and they're all kind of together, spread apart, but you know, together and masked and all that. And then the rest of us are, in, are kept separate and we are absolutely not allowed into that room, um, except for after the execution, if the, the victim's family member wants to address the press and then it's like, everybody's welcome. But as Kelly highlighted and what I've tried to say over and over again, both on Twitter and in my coverage, you know, you only hear from the families of the victims in those cases. Um, and, and there is no, no uh, forum, uh, not only for the families of the condemned, but also for the defense attorneys and the uh, spiritual advisors. Uh, and it's really to the credit of the activists on the ground um, who created that space at the Dollar General. You know, as you all probably know, there's this Dollar General in Terre Haute across the street from the penitentiary. And that sort of became once activists successfully sued to gain access to that space, that became the place where family members um, could could uh, actually address um, the people who were gathered there. And that first happened. That's how I first met, although I had speak, spoken to her many times, um, the mother of Christopher Vialva, uh, who was the seventh man um, put to death. Um, and Lisa Brown, who was his mom, she witnessed um, his execution. She was there that morning. Um, and she became a really important a touchstone for me in terms of my coverage, but also she changed the nature of the coverage um, more broadly. She she was the first to really have a voice um, and to really uh, reveal the impact and the trauma on the families of the condemned. Um, and I'm very grateful to her because she also, she took it upon herself to create a sort of network where she could uh, between family members. Um, and she it was very important to her because the the process of tr trying to navigate the logistics of her son's execution had been so confusing and so dehumanizing. She really wanted to make herself available to other families so that it wouldn't be so hard for them. And so I ended up getting in touch uh, later with um, Janice Matthews, who was the partner of Orlando Hall. Um, I spoke to Orlando Hall's one of his, he had six kids, I believe. I spoke to his son and they told me their story. And, and so much of what Suzanne and what you all were talking about, um, it's painful. It's, it's painful to listen to those interviews still because they talk about this dehumanizing uh, process in which, and a surreal process in which they are essentially, they come to witness the killing of their loved ones and they are expected to sort of abide by this protocol and kind of submit politely to this process in which you have to board the van, you have to do all these things, you have to wait, you know. And what's happening is your loved one is being killed, you know. Um, Lisa Brown, when she got the death certificate for Christopher Vialva, um, she was very, very angry because they misspelled her name. So an additional sort of insult there. But also, you know, she said, it says homicide. It says homicide. And this is my proof. You know, this is my proof. Um, it was validating to her that that was like, the, what she knew to be true was true. Um, so, so I've tried, the family members, the loved ones I've met, um, have really shaped my coverage um, and, and continue to shape my coverage. I'm currently writing about um, that last week, uh, the execution of Dustin Higgs. I got to know his sister, Alexa, a bit. Um, she, because I was never, you know, I, I, was, I wasn't able to witness, but I, I know from the coverage and from the media witnesses on the ground that uh, 
she was sobbing very, very loudly. I mean, so loudly that it was audible to the to the witnesses in the other room, um, you know, throughout her her brother's execution. And I haven't had a chance to talk to her since the execution. I try to give people their space, um, but 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 speaking to her in advance of it, it echoes what Kelly said about you know wanting eight eight more days. You know, she, to her, just the arbitrariness of killing Dustin less than a week before the inauguration. And what she kept saying, she says, I just need six more days. If I just need six more days, if I could just have six more days. And so I was thinking about her during the inauguration um, and yeah, just the senselessness of it. Um, it it's hard to sort of put to words. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. And what you've been through, my Lord. Um, thank you. Thank, and thank you for all your reporting and, and for sharing this with us. And, you know, you were touching on this, but it's one of the, one of the strength, the, the most horrific aspects of it is the way in which kind of the machinery of death is, is a, it's like a handyman work. It's kind of so makeshift too, at the same time, you know, you were talking about this, like, you know, getting together at the general, at the, at the dollar general across the street or something. I remember, you know, in, in Doyle Ham's case, which is where we got to know each other, you know, I, you know, this is like two, two years ago, the, 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 uh, the warden tells me basically, you know, we'll pick you up at the BP station, you know, we'll pick you up at the BP the BP station, what do you mean you can pick me up at the BP station, right? I go to the BP station to get picked up. Of course, nobody comes to pick me up because there's a stay going on. So, so, you know, and there's no, there's not even, there's no, there's no inside the BP station. It's just a couple of pumps, <laughs> you know, and that's where, you know, I'm supposed to get, it's just like, they, it's make, this is, the machine, we're, we're killing people and it's just kind of put together with like, you know, scotch tape and gum, basically. Um, and it's just, it's just crazy. Uh, but thank you, uh, Liliana. And so what, what I'd like to do next is to ask Alexis Hope to really touch, touch on the question of kind of the, the urgent need to, to abolish the federal death penalty right now. Just let me introduce you quickly. I mean, Everybody knows you, I think, but uh, still, we have a lot of people on the on the channel. Um, so, Alexis Hogue is the inaugural practitioner in residence at the Eric H. Holder Jr. Initiative for Civil and Political Rights here at Columbia University, and uh, she's a great colleague here. And she will soon be professor of law at Brooklyn Law School, and so we're really excited about that. So we get to be colleagues in New York. Uh, she has spent over a decade as a civil rights and criminal defense lawyer. Uh, primarily representing uh, capitally convicted clients in federal post-conviction proceedings at the uh, Capitol Habeas Unit in Tennessee uh, with Kelly Henry. Uh, her, so we've got a big, we've got a big Tennessee uh, connection here today. Uh, her scholarship focuses on racism's impact on the criminal legal system, on capital punishment, and on jury selection and uh, service. So thank you so much for joining us, Alexis. We've, uh, we've worked together a lot. We, 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 we teach together the Abolition Practicum, which, uh, which, um, which is a great, great course here at Columbia Law School. Thanks, Alexis. And why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about this urgent need uh, to abolish the federal death penalty? Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, and it's a real treat for me to be on a panel uh, with Kelly Henry, uh, who after Judge Nixon was my first boss outside of law school. I really had faith in me that I could do this work um, and represent uh, the clients that we've been speaking about. Um, it's so important for us um, it, during this conversation to bear witness, which is what we've all been doing with Liliana. Uh, has been doing in Terre Haute. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to elevate the humanity of those that our government has cast aside as the worst of the worst. And I so appreciate being part of this conversation uh, where we can recognize that the men um, and Lisa Montgomery were worth more than the worst thing, uh, the worst act that they were convicted of. Uh, and so with my 10 minutes or so, I'd like to speak to this urgent need to abolish the federal death penalty. Um, we need to, to eradicate the possibility of some future administration being able to use it as a political tool. Uh, we need to return some semblance of credibility to the US Supreme Court and the Department of Justice, which has really been tarnished during the, the Trump administration. 
Uh, and we need to encourage the states to follow suit and also abolish the death penalty. We have 28 states uh, that still have uh, the death penalty in addition to the federal government. And then running throughout each of these, which is what I teach on and write on, is the pervasive anti-Black racism uh, in the administration of the death penalty. And so the driving force still uh, for local district attorneys, for the federal government in seeking death, in jurors sentencing individuals to death, and even in execution, so throughout the post-conviction process, is the Black race of the defendant combined often with the white race of the victim. And so this is really steeped in this history of this nation where our original colonial law specified the race of the victim to determine whether or not an act was even criminal. And so our earliest laws did not recognize Black people as citizens, let alone even victims of crime. And so the only means for redress, and this is in this er early colonial period in the, in the infancy of our nation, was uh, through property law. So a white person who owned an enslaved person could be reimbursed for damage or lost property. So today, what do we see? Jennifer Eberhardt, uh, who's a scholar at Stanford University, had a 2006 study uh, looking death worthy, which showed that the more phenotypically black a defendant looks, the broader the nose, the thicker the lips, the darker the skin, the more likely a jury is to sentence that person to death. And this is heightened in a cross racial crime. So when you have a, a, white, a white victim. Scott Phillips and Justin Moreau just last year in 2020 published a study where they found that defendants who were convicted, Black defendants convicted of killing white people were 17 times more likely to be executed than those convicted of killing a Black victim. So this means that our government undervalues the lives of Black murder victims. And the government treats these crimes less harshly than the murders of white victims is reminiscent of the thousands of lynchings of Black people that occurred in this country um, after the Civil War, really through the Civil Rights Movement. And with very few exceptions, no one was held accountable for these vicious murders. And EJI, uh, where Bernard, I know you started your career before it was even called EJI, uh, has recently uncovered 2,000 lynchings that occurred just during the period of Reconstruction. So it's about 10 years immediately after the Civil War. They've uncovered another 4,000 lynchings between Reconstruction and the Second World War. And in most of these lynchings, law enforcement was often directly involved or they failed to intervene. This was true in Hamilton County, Chattanooga, Tennessee, where Kelly and I still have a client who's been sentenced to death, an unmitigated lynching that went right up to the US Supreme Court. And so today in these same counties, where you have the highest rates of lynching against black people, you continue to have the highest rates of capital punishment. And so we're, Kelly and I practice in Tennessee, Nashville, which is where our office was located, relative to Shelby County, Memphis in the Western part of the state, Memphis had five times as many lynchings as the middle of Tennessee. And today, the vast majority of the death penalty, those that are sentenced to death in that state, come from Memphis, come from Shelby County. So this is over a hundred years later. So this legacy, this stain of slavery and anti-Black terrorism is still with us today in 2021. And this says nothing about the pervasive anti-Black racism that we experience in jury selection. And so this is where prosecutors remove Black people, Black prospective jurors, even if they're lucky enough to make it into the pool, um, and this is true in California, in Washington State, in North Carolina, in Tennessee. I'm citing studies, scholarship that's been produced from the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, most recently from Berkeley Law's Death Penalty Clinic. And this is in state and federal court. And they're, they're being removed at alarming rates. And so the solution here is not to reform or to modify or slow capital punishment, it's to abolish it. And eradicating um, through federal legislation, the federal death penalty, removes it as a future tool for a, another administration. So what we've seen in this last six months, what Liliana has been front row to, is that abolition is necessary because otherwise it'll still be on the table for a future administration. What we've witnessed is a grotesque spectacle 
of injustice, where the Trump administration used the death penalty essentially to exercise, to display their power to kill. And we've all read these headlines, 13 executions in six months, more than in the last six decades combined, that Trump has, has um, supervised, overseen more executions than any president in over 120 years. These were gratuitous killings in the midst of a global pandemic where in this country we have some of the highest rates of infection. You've already heard Kelly and her, her um, colleague. Two of the, the most recent executions, uh, the late Corey Johnson and, and Dustin Higgs tested positive for coronavirus. I also mentioned this idea of returning some semblance of credibility to our highest court and to the Department of Justice. So as, as Kelly has already explained in Lisa Montgomery's case, the federal government was asking the US Supreme Court, asking the lower federal courts to, to really um, skip over a thoughtful, meaningful administration of justice. In Corey Hicks' execution, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals did not have the opportunity to weigh in what was the appropriate law in terms of execution to use? Uh, what Should it be Indiana, where Terre Haute is located, where Federal Death Row is located, or Maryland, the jurisdiction in which uh, Mr. Higgs was originally prosecuted? And so this leapfrogging that happened. And we have Justice Sotomayor, who continues to be the moral compass of the US Supreme Court, weighing in with a strong dissent, along with Justice Breyer, um, really cautioning the Supreme Court's um, ignoring this idea of, of a clear administration of justice. And then you have the Department of Justice. And we haven't spoken as much about the um, uptick in federal prosecutions under the Trump administration. So we have 13 executions. We have over 30 individuals where the Department of Justice is seeking death. So this is pre-trial. People are, are, are pre-trial or, or they're in the midst of, of trial of um, a, a federal capital trial. And during these last four years, under Attorney General Barr and Attorney General Sessions, you actually had the Department of Justice avoiding giving any sort of meaningful review to an invitation to have the defense attorneys come to DC and really plead a case for life. This was part of the normal procedure before this current, uh, or the prior Trump administration, where you'd have a defense attorney come and, 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 and investigate, develop, present the mitigating evidence that they would put in at trial. And under Attorney General Sessions and Barr, they really uh, curtailed this process. And so we have um, really a stain on the Department of Justice. Um, and then also I wanna speak about the idea of encouraging the states to abolish the death penalty if we have strong legislation and strong messaging coming from um, our, our federal Congress and our federal administration. And so the question at the state level shouldn't be, do these people that have engaged in aggravated acts, do they deserve to die? It's, it's do we as a society deserve to kill? And that answer is no. So we do have pending legislation and I don't have as many details about the viability of each of these bills um, in front of Virginia uh, California, Kentucky, Missouri, South Carolina. I know there are uh, exemptions for defendants who suffer from serious mental illness. We have bills pending in Ohio and also in Texas. But where I want to end my comments is that the, the next best alternative to abolishing the death penalty isn't an automatic uh, replacement uh, with uh, life without the opportunity of parole. An LWAP is not the answer because it still perpetuates all of the racial inequality that I opened with. Um, it's still an excessive sentence. And what it does is it puts out of sight then these executions. So, so Liliana and, and her other uh, colleagues and journalists who have been uplifting, bearing witness, shedding light on what we otherwise wouldn't see, it's much more difficult to track the lives and the experiences of those that we put away for a sort of bloodless, invisible death when we're condemning them to prison for life. And so I think that's um, gonna be where I'm gonna focus and where I hope those of us that, that represent individuals who have been sentenced to death on eradicating not just the death penalty, but ensuring that we don't simply replace it with LWAP. If we want to move away from a carceral focused paradigm, 
we can't simply have have LWAP instead of instead of the death penalty. Thank you, Alexis. That's that's so right, and that's precisely one of the most important places to to end here in terms of the the, the formal presentations. And and in part, that's the whole idea of abolition democracy, right? Um, the whole idea is not simply to achieve these crucial and important forms of discrete abolition, uh, but in actually putting into place uh, the kind of institutions that a society needs in order to not let those, uh, those practices take place anymore. And so, and so you know, W.E. Du Bois's point, of course, with abolition democracy was precisely that you know, it wasn't enough just to abolish the death penalty. Right? We, had to, we had to put in place uh, uh, institutions that would allow for, uh, for, for society to become equal, institutions of equal, of equality, of justice, et cetera. And, and what you, where you ended is so important, right? It would not be in any way enough to abolish the death penalty, right? And we, we, we live in a punitive society uh, that has so many dimensions of punitiveness uh, from life imprisonment without parole uh, to uh, all of the forms of uh, solitary confinement or or uh, or or over in or, or over uh, uh, po populations in, in in incarcerated settings. I mean, in in you know the 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 uh, the way in which we 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 either we either place individuals in isolation or we warehouse individuals in, in these spaces where they have no, no privacy, no way of, kind of, uh, of living properly. But, but all of the dimensions of the punitive society, we, we, need to, we need to think about, and we need to think about them as integrated. Um, that was the idea of abolition democracy, and that surely is the idea, and that surely is the idea of this, uh, of this public seminar, right? Because our last seminar was precisely on abolishing the punitive society. Uh, not just these particular um, measures. But abolishing the federal death penalty will be a place to start. And, uh, and on a historic day when we have the first president who has, and vice president who have expressed their desire to uh, abolish the death penalty, I think we really need to seize this moment. Now, um, we have, an, uh, I think uh, what might make sense is to kind of open up the conversation now um, to among ourselves, but also to everyone else who's watching. We have, a, we have a large number of participants. We have a large number of questions that are coming in. Um, and so I think what we should do, and I'd like to invite the, the students, the graduate students in the course also to, to come live uh, if you'd like to ask your questions. Uh, anyone else who wants to come uh, live um, can get in touch with uh, with Fonda, and we can we can get you to turn on your uh, video. Also, I know Ron Tabak is uh, is with us as well, uh, who has done extraordinary work for decades, um, and was also representing uh, one of the co-counsel for. Um, Corey Johnson, uh, and so please feel free to, for everyone, feel free to kind of turn on your videos and join us uh, and ask questions. Um, I also know that I think Tom Durkin is out there, my colleague who I've worked with uh, for many years on, 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 other, on other cases, uh, including Guantanamo and um, uh, also, so all you, if you just send a, send a message to, to Fonda Shen, she will uh, give you the opportunity to just turn on your, your video and join us. So please do. Let's start with some of these questions that we have. Um, uh, you know, one of them is, um, uh, is, is whether there's any kind of Republican support for abolition. Uh, and, and this is coming from Joshua Spears. And the question here really is kind of, you know, what kind of Republican support do have we seen for abolition? And uh, um, you know, the point is there. Joshua writes, you know, there there is a lot of libertarian opposition to the death penalty, but what are we seeing actually uh, on the ground now? And I I I actually uh, am not uh, I, I I haven't seen much myself. Um, Liliana, have you have you been able to follow this at all in terms of uh, whether there is any 
kind of by bipartisanship that can be achieved? Uh, is, is there any hope here of uh, bipartisanship or of this new uh, unity that we're trying to find? You know, it's hard for me to speak to that. I don't really cover politics, like legislative politics, and so don't have, I don't feel like I have the best answer. I will say that the one time I did try to cover here in Nashville, um, what felt like a very reasonable piece of legislation to uh, to uh, uh, ban um, severe uh, people with severe mental illness um, from getting the death penalty. The hijinks I saw from Republican lawmakers in the face of just sound science, um, it was it was sobering. I was like, oh yeah, I mean, this is Tennessee, so <laughs> the legislature is pretty uh, pretty out there. Um, but but I do think uh, that was that made me very pessimistic. Granted, you know. On the other hand, you know, Virginia is in a place that I did not expect, I could not have imagined, um, you know, uh, being just just a year ago. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I don't know, I can't speak too specifically. Um, I think there's some really interesting movement going on, but um, my hope is to, going forward, my hope is to team up possibly with some of the Intercepts political reporters who, who are in DC and other places to try to try to address that. I'd be really interested in what other people have to say about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Has anyone seen of any, 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 any bipartisanship at all on these issues or? Uh... Or um, yeah, I or think, it, I think it's happening. Yeah. Um, there's energy. There's appetite for it at the state level, um, and and maybe without the Trump administration, we'll get uh, a little bit more cour courageousness from the Republicans at the federal level. Um, but I know Hannah Cox, um, who was based in Nashville for many years, I think she's now in New York, um, is is sort of head of communications of conservatives concerned about the death penalty, and they're re really looking and, and taking a look at an economic argument, um, a moral one as well, uh, in terms of, um, you know, holding life as sacred at birth. And so why not at death as well, um, doing some strategizing and organizing, but I, I really think her efforts are focused at the state level. And so I, I'm not as aware of Republicans in, in uh, federal Congress, um, who are on board. I know the former representative Amash was a libertarian um, supported Ayanna Presley um, in advancing and in qualified immunity and was looking at some really ambitious uh, reforms in the criminal legal system, but of course he's no longer in office. Um, and so I think it's, it's to stay tuned. My hope is that we're gonna get folks on the other side uh, really promoting this, this sort of legislation, particularly after what we saw on January 6th. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, uh, so uh, here, let me let me throw in some question. We've got a great like if you go to the questions and answers, we've got great questions coming in. We had we had a question from Hannah Trudeau from the Daily Beast, but the question was for Representative Espayat about conversations with the Biden transition team, um, and unfortunately, uh, Representative Espayat is no longer with us on the call right now, so we we won't be able to get that. Um, however, I have a question here. A, 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 a kind of a, a legal question uh, from uh, Ramanujan Nadadur, uh, which is, can Congress abolish a death penalty at the federal level in such a way that could lead to abolishment at the state level? For example, could Congress enact legislation abolishing the death penalty that could preempt state imposition of the death penalty? Or could federal legislation raising constitutional questions about the death penalty be used to litigate the abolition of death penalty at the state level. Kelly, you of course deal with uh, the relationship because at the uh, Capitol habeas unit, you're dealing not only with persons who are sentenced to death under the federal death penalty, but you're also dealing with the habeas corpus actions of individuals in Tennessee who have um, been sentenced to death by the courts in Tennessee, but who are presenting their claims in federal habeas corpus. Kelly, do you think in any way that there is a way to jigger the federal level in such a way that it would have effects at the state level? This is such a great question because one of the things that's on my mind as someone who primarily represents people who have been convicted at the state level is the importance of rolling back the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. Because when Congress enacted EDPA in 1995, it's so tied the hands of federal courts in habeas that we have seen an increase in folks being executed, even though a federal court under pre-1995 law may have actually set those sentences aside. So that is one concrete step that Congress can take to repeal that portion of the Anti-Terrorism Death Penalty Act. 
But the federal government could go further. It could offer incentives to states to abolish the death penalty. It could say, if you abolish the death penalty, we'll give you X number of dollars for victims' rights or X number of dollars for counseling for victims or we'll help, you know, give you money. You know, everything's buckets of money, right? So buckets of money to um, help with food insecurity or you know, child um, trauma or you know, domestic violence because these are all things that we know leads to homicides. Mm -hmm. And if we really want to get at the root cause of homicide, the death penalty isn't effective. What is effective is to make sure that people have a safe place to live, that they can keep the lights on, that their children can get an education, that they can get enough rest, that if they and have drug and alcohol problems, we can help them. And most importantly, investing in our mental health system. You know, if the federal government could say, if you abolish the death penalty, we're going to give you buckets of money to make sure that there's an effective community mental health program. That would go so far to ending crime and trauma and preventing more victims. So what a great question. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and what's great is the, the questions, if you pop into the questions and answers also, um, we're also getting some answers too, but it's uh, so interesting. Uh, so one, one person was saying we need to discuss the AEDPA, which Kelly, you just started, and that's really key. I mean, the, AE, the Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act uh, passed uh, in the mid-1990s by by uh, Democrats who were very different than, than they are going to be uh, this, this term, right? Um, has certain provisions in it that have made it impossible to litigate these uh, cases, impossible to litigate the state cases in federal court, really, to, to hear them on the merits. And, um, and part of it has to do with, um, uh, with some of the arbitrary ways in which review happens. So, so in other words, uh, it, it blocks review basically by the appellate courts, by the, uh, by the courts of appeals, unless, unless you get a certificate of appealability. And we, we litigated that last year in, in, uh, in, a, in a case that we tried to get the Supreme Court interested in. And there's some information about it. Maybe Fonda can share that information uh, in the chat. But, uh, but you know, the 11th Circuit is, the, the judges on the 11th Circuit are so, there's such arbitrariness as to some judges granting at a rate of like less about 2% of certificates of appealabilities, other judges granting at 25%. And of course, it's a random draw who you get. They don't, it doesn't even go to a panel of three judges. So you don't get reviewed by three judges. You just get reviewed by one judge. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. Um, so that's a whole other area that we need to. And I think you're right that if we get uh, some action on the AEDPA, it will have important implications uh, at the state level as well. Um, thanks, Tom, for joining us, uh, co-counsel on, uh, on many cases. Um, uh, especially uh, one that's uh, active right now. Um, nice to see you. Want to jump in? Well, I, if there was time, I, I wanted to ask Kelly and or anyone else. Um, I, I was an, an undergraduate at Notre Dame, and and I was particularly incensed by uh, Justice Barrett's participation in these last um, uh, bloodbaths, you know, Trump executions. Um, because I, I know she was a, a, a mentor of Scalia um, and the Federalist Society, but she's a staunch Catholic. And it's my understanding that the Pope has recently come out and declared the death penalty um, impermissible. And I know that Scalia, and I also know she wrote an article um, discussing the role of a Catholic in a position where her faith would lead her to different principles. And, and I was astounded that she didn't recuse herself. At least I've read all those writings of both Scalia and her to say, well, if you, if you really, if your religion precludes you from uh, participating in something, you at least have to recuse yourself. Um, did she make any comments or any statements about that in, in any, I, I didn't see any in the, in the press. But it's my understanding she did participate in all of the decisions. Is that correct? That is that is correct, and she, the, she participated without comment. Um, you know, I would note that the president of Notre Dame actually came out 
um, in the final days of the administration, um, condemning the federal executions and particularly in support of, of Lisa Montgomery, um, as well as Cardinal Dolan and, and others who um, from the Catholic Church were supportive of uh, Mrs. Montgomery and the other defendants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, the reason I ask is, is that it might be worth thinking about putting some pressure, more pressure on Notre Dame um, because in, in the same, I, I might've been the same piece that he sent, but, uh, and the Catholic bishops just came out against Biden in an absurd statement yesterday that was criticized by a lot of the more progressive bishops that uh, they're, they're now talk about prenatal rights uh, and that Biden, they're prenatal all justice. prenatal justice and they're concerned about that <clears throat> might be an appropriate time to, you know, lobby against Notre Dame. And I, I'd be happy to help anyone who wanted to, I, I, I know quite a few people at Notre Dame and I'd be more than happy if somebody wanted to address, you know, write a letter asking them to participate. Great, great, terrific. Uh, welcome Jocelyn Simonson, who's teaching this year at Columbia Law School. Thanks for, 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 for coming on. Um, and Julia Udell, you have a, a question, I take it from Kyle, is that right? Yes, yeah, from Wild May. Yeah, Lyle, I'm sorry. Um, tell us a little bit first about Lyle May, uh, who, uh, who has been in our class. Uh, the, we were teaching a class uh, called Abolition Practicum. Nadir, I'll come to you in a minute as well. Um, uh, Alexis and I, and we were fortunate enough to have Lyle May uh, come speak to the class. Um, tell us a little bit about Lyle and then why don't you uh, play his question for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Lyle would have wanted to call in himself, but unfortunately his unit in North Carolina Central Prison is on lockdown right now. So I have a recording of it and I'll put it in the chat too. But Lyle is a prolific writer and journalist and advocate who has been on North Carolina's death row since 1999 and incarcerated in North Carolina since he was 19 years old in 1997. And he is a huge leader, not only in the movement to abolish the death penalty, but also in the movement to abolish and dismantle the broader prison industrial complex. And he is just a brilliant person who I feel very grateful to have learned from and to work with. And um, I know he'd be really excited to hear what everyone has been saying today. So I will put his, I will find a way to put his question in the chat, but first I'll play it for you. Here okay, it is. Great, thanks, Julia. Perfect. Okay. Lisa Montgomery's recent execution, like that of other federal prisoners, put to death as political pawns during Trump's presidency, emphasizes the need for abolition of the death penalty. And moreover, it screams the need for a federal clemency board removed from the slain panel of politics. Now that the Biden presidency has begun, it's time to hold the administration accountable for its place and federal executions. The question then is, how do we move forward to implement abolition? Who can we enlist or pursue? What office door must be battered until a response comes? Great. Thank you, Julia. So uh, who, who wants to start tackling that? Alexis, maybe? You got some, some thoughts on that? Um, And, and Julia, just to clarify, how, how can we um, push the federal government to move forward with abolition to remove sort of their ability to use um, federal executions as political pawns? Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that um, the momentum is strong in our favor for, for federal abolition. Um, you know, it's the, the post that, that Fonda wrote just this morning uh, and that Bernard opened our conversation with this idea that we have for the first time a sitting president that is affirmatively in favor of federal abolition. Um, and, and I think we need to work hard on pushing our elected officials. Um, and it was a real pleasure to have Representative Espayat, who's my representative here in Harlem, um, who is a co-author of one of these pending bills. Um, I think we need to be on the phone. We need to be collectively demonstrating. I think we all saw how powerful mass demonstrations were um, as, as we called for uh, black lives this summer. Um, and so I think we need to start um, and, and continue the pressure there. Um, and, then, and then to not let up, um, because I think once we get, um, hopefully, this sort of legislation passed at the federal level to really push hard on the individual states. 
And when uh, the courts start to think about sort of these evolving standards of decency, like wh where are we as a country in relationship to capital punishment? If we take it off the table at the federal level, I think that um, creates a really compelling argument that under individual state constitutions, when they're looking at the appetite of people to sentence other people to death, um, I, I think having, having an abolition at the federal level is a, is a really strong indicator um, that needs to be taken off the table at the individual state level as well. Yeah, yeah. And you know, on that, on that, that connects a little bit to the earlier discussion about, well, are there, is there any bipartisanship, uh, et cetera? Uh, some of the interesting uh, comments uh, online, you know, Sidney Scully is emphasizing the governor of Ohio is Republican and against the death penalty. And uh, another person is talking about um, a conservative group in Pennsylvania uh, that is against the death penalty, including uh, Pennsylvania Catholics who, who are conservative and against the death penalty. So, you know, there might be ways of uh, uh, breaching the aisles and, uh, and getting some bipartisanship here. There was a, there was a question about um, the relationship between res, uh, Representative Espaillat and Representative Presley's bills. Um, so basically my understanding and, um, is that uh, there are both bills are in the house now and both are accumulating uh, as many sponsors as possible. They would both abolish the federal death penalty. My understanding is, uh, Representative Espaillat's bill also has language that deals specifically with excising all references to the death penalty in all of the other provisions of the code. So basically, you know, um, it's a funny thing about a, a criminal code, but oftentimes it will be, uh, there will be changes, but then they won't be reflected throughout. So all of a sudden there'll be references to the death penalty somewhere else in the code. And, 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 uh, and I think uh, part of what uh, Representative Espaillat's bill does is to actually excise all, all references throughout, which is a, a, an important uh, piece of it. But I believe, uh, but basically those are, those are, you know, those are going to be joining efforts. Uh, and on the House side, of course, there's uh, Dick, Bur Dick Durbin's effort uh, from Illinois. Uh, so there's movement on both sides. Um, Nadira, you've got a question. Anita, you've got a question. I wanted to get Jocelyn in as well and Ron Tabak who's joining us and, uh, and others. So let's start with you though, Nadira. Yes, I had um, two quick um, questions. One is um, to the attorneys who are defending um, the clients who are on death row. Have you um, been able to collaborate with um, former prosecutors or families of the victims who have maybe changed their mind and are speak, like advocating to stop any execution? And has that been successful? Um, and then the other question is, what role can social workers um, play in the abolishment um, movement? I'm at the School of Social Work, and this has been a topic that I've been very interested in. Um, and I'm just... Uh, Baff, like I wonder, um, is there an avenue to maybe remove the reservation that was placed by the United States when they signed the ICCPR mm -hmm. um, for the right to life um, and uh, framing it more as like a human rights um, right. question? Right, right. That's 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 a great and that's a great reminder actually because there's another front where the Biden administration could uh, could. Uh, make an effort, which would be signing the uh, ICPSR, getting rid of that uh, exception for the death penalty. Thanks. Kelly, do you have any thoughts on the first question, which is kind of working with prosecutors and others? Uh, so I have had some success in the past working both with prosecutors and victims' family members. Um, Liliana spoke um, about a, a case where I didn't have as much success as I had hoped with um, Cynthia Vaughn, who was Don Johnson's stepdaughter and the daughter of the victim um, in the case. And, you know, Cynthia went from being a staunch advocate for the death penalty to having forgiven uh, Mr. Johnson for his role in her mother's death and pleading to the governor for clemency on behalf of Mr. Johnson, basically saying, if you execute him, you will harm me. And that 
didn't move the needle for clemency, which was heartbreaking. Um, in the case of Gail Owens, her son, Stephen Owens, um, initially and for many, many years, sought her execution. And then, you know, they had a, a moment where he forgave her and then he became an advocate um, for Gail, resulting in Gail ultimately receiving clemency and um, her release from prison. Mm -hmm. I would also say with respect to um, social workers, Social workers are the most important members of our teams. The, the people who do the mitigation work are often have a social work background. And it is the way that we tell our clients stories that make all of the difference in the world. We would not have learned about Lisa Montgomery's um, you know, horrible story of trauma, just unrelenting pervasive trauma without the assistance of our mitigation specialist. So I encourage you to... Um, can do, you know, do more research on mitigation specialists and what that takes because um, stories are what save our clients' lives. And by telling our clients stories, what social workers are able to do, that's how we are able to persuade courts. Yeah, I can't yeah. emphasize that enough. I cannot emphasize that enough, Susanna. I just want a very brief follow-up um, to what you said, Kelly, and, and came up earlier. So if a murder happens within a family, which happens in cases of domestic violence, which was also mentioned, then the, let's say it's just for the sake of uh, description, let's say the father is convicted of killing a mother. The children in that situation are families of the murder victim and families of the person being sentenced to death and executed, right? What we have seen, and I have stories about this I won't take time to go into, but is that the, the children kind of forfeit uh, the services of victims advocates, you know, so that even though they are the children of the murder victim, and should be entitled to all of that, the victim's advocates no longer show up for them. So it's like you can't be both, even though they are both. <laughs> they are literally relatives of the murder victim and relatives of the person being executed. But they'll, you know, there's a, a young man whose father killed his mother. He was 14. He was standing outside the prison when his father was being executed. And there was no victim advocate there to help him. He was given none of the kind of attention that we were hearing earlier families of murder victims would be given, even though his mother had been murdered. But it's kind of like we can't officially wrap our minds around the idea that you, one could be both of those. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing that with us and for kind of uh, exposing another kind of dark side to this. Uh, so that's 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 really um, disturbing. Um, Anita, and I see Ivan has also got a question. Anita, you were next. Um, Hi, thanks. Um, so I was curious also about the angle on family impact. Um, so some people had written about potential ways to better involve families of people on death row. And I was wondering if there's any way we can use those for abolition. So I remember like Rachel King and Catherine Norgard at one point proposed recognizing the right to family similar to the right to privacy or adding uh, family impact as a mitigating factor. So I was just curious, what are our options for helping families or really, are there any? Um, Susanna, do you, wanna, do you wanna jump in again? Yeah, uh, you know, years ago, a bunch of us had the idea that the potential impact on let's say the children in the case could be used as an argument, could be presented as mitigating. And we had a couple of attorneys that actually wanted to, to try that. Um, but I think the difficulty so far, and, and perhaps Kelly can speak to this legally, but the difficulty was that it was sort of hypothetical. It was either you were gonna bring in another child of a different already executed person who would speak to, here's the impact that this has on a family, or you would have the children of the not yet executed person kind of saying, I think this will be traumatic. And somehow, as compelling as that is to all of us, there was some concern that that would be difficult to present legally. But it's still something that I, I think I and others think a lot about. Right. Um, so I've got Ivan, I've got uh, Jocelyn, and then I want to hear from Ron Tabak as well. And anybody else, uh, uh, tell me. We've also got questions coming in. But um, uh, Ivan? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Welcome back. Thanks for Thank joining you. us again. Uh, Ivan is uh, here at Columbia, one of our extraordinary justice and education fellows who was on our Abolition Democracy 113 and, and Abolition Democracy 213 and has been with us all along. Thanks so much for being here, Ivan. Go ahead. No, I just want to say first, thank you, Bernard. This, is, this has been amazing. I mean, I've been 
<clears throat> sort of struggling with emotions all day long, listening to all the testimony. Uh, this has been this has been tough. This has been rough. Um, so I'm just gonna just be really brief. Um, how so to all the attorneys? Uh, how invested? So I'm talking about the government attorneys who are prosecuting these cases. How invested do you find generally that they are in uh, in having the the person that they're prosecuting killed? Uh, uh, do they have reservations? Do you find that they have reservations? Do they have hesitations? And does that decision? Uh, to seek the death penalty come from higher up, you know. Uh, I, I don't know if I've, I'm sort of struggling with some emotions here because this is this is a um, very sensitive topic. But I just want to know how invested some of these prosecutors' attorneys are in having the uh, in having the person that they're prosecuting murdered by the state. Thanks, thanks, Ivan. I'm going to ask Kelly to start. I want Liliana to start also because I think you've spoken with a lot of. I mean, because as a reporter, you kind of uh, spend a lot of time. So uh, Kelly and then Liliana. You know, once an execution warrant happens, I am often shocked at the level of rage and anger and hostility that comes at us from the government lawyers. And it's really shocking to me, um, the ways in which, um, I, I think I described it after Lisa's um, execution, it's craven bloodlust. And that's really, what it is and there's no rational thought as far as i'm concerned from the other side it just becomes um it's time for this person to die and they're going to make sure that they that they die and i mean i have a hard time separating what they do from premeditated murder to be quite honest and i know that that sounds a little um histrionic but it's certainly the way it feels in the moment Mm, yeah, Liliana, you've uh, you've kind of spoken to both sides a lot during these cases. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, to the extent I've reached, I do try to reach out to all the prosecutors in the cases I, I work with. And I think the flip side of what Kelly has described, one of the, and I'm so glad you asked this question, because one of the things that I have found really disturbing is not so much the prosecutors who, many of whom have since retired, who, who continue to defend these convictions, even if they're not doing that professionally, that, that this is a conviction they won and they're gonna defend it uh, and no matter what sort of evidence has come out, no matter what problems have been exposed with the case. Um, and those can be very revealing. Um, but the ones that I find most eye-opening are the cases in which the prosecutors I've reached no longer really remember the case, you know? I mean, they took all kinds of measures to convince a jury that the, the death penalty was absolutely necessary here, that, you know, the, for the victim's families, this was going to be closure, all of these things. And then years later, decades later, if they remember the case, that the details are fuzzy, you know, and, and it's just clear that they haven't thought about it. For them, it was part of a career. They built their careers and this is something they won. And 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 it, they haven't been living the reality of what it means to, to, to the families of the condemned or the families of the victims who were promised closure and, and have not received it, have just sort of lived with this. And so I found that disturbing. I also should, I just want to specifically mention, you know, in the case of Orlando Hall, a man, a black man who was convicted by an all white jury. Um, I did speak to that prosecutor. He continue, a man with a very long documented history, first in Dallas County and then at the federal level of, of, of excluding uh, black jurors, he continued to defend that. And then um, one of the two uh, uh, prosecutors in the case of um, Brandon Bernard and Christopher Vialva, who told me there was one black juror on that uh, uh, case and and this prosecutor was very proud of the fact that he had allowed this black juror on the jury that, that but many people around him told him he was crazy to to accept a black juror uh, in this case and he was sort of saying that by way of kind of boasting and sort of saying look how look how progressive I was to sort of allow this black juror on this case which is just you know it's those moments where it's like um you know, it's always worth reaching out to them because chances are you're going to learn something or, you know, it, 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 but it always sort of, it, it only sort of uh, reframes the senselessness and, and, and the lack of, um, uh, I don't know, uh, I, it, it's hard for me to put into words. I will say one time I spoke to a prosecutor in Arkansas who felt an obligation to attend the executions of, of, of people he had, uh, he had sent to death row. But by and large, I don't find that that's the case. I find that a lot of prosecutors, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. It makes it all the more powerful when you have the exceptional one or two former prosecutors who does actually come out 
against the death penalty. So that happened in Dwayne Buck's case, which came before the US Supreme Court and you had the, the second chair prosecutor. So this is a prosecution that had happened decades before. It was Linda Geffen. She actually attended the Supreme Court oral argument. And that was a case in which defense counsel acting ineffectively put on evidence that uh, their client, Mr. Buck, uh, was likely to be more dangerous in the future because he was Black. And the prosecutors ran with that information and ran with it on closing, um, as, as a, a, a most prosecutors would um, when the defense gives you a, a gift like that. Um, but Linda, years later, came out against the death penalty for Mr. Mr. Buck. And that made it truly exceptional because of the plethora of prosecutors, as Kelly and Liliana has detailed, do not come out against. Um, and you see in some amicus strategizing where um, an advocate will reach out to retired prosecutors, sometimes head AG, so maybe not the individual who actually prosecuted the case, but former prosecutors that collectively can come out, draft an amicus brief against the death penalty. Um, but it's it's hard. It, 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 when you can get a prosecutor or the prosecutor or a prosecutor's support, it can be really powerful because it is so exceptional. Yeah. I'll just pipe in with one anecdote, uh, Ivan, which was which really uh, floored me. Um, I was, you know, this was in this was a opposing counsel. Uh, Alabama, in Alabama, and uh, it was an, it's someone who I've uh, been litigating against for you know over thirty years, so I know this person, and uh, she had been uh, the attorney uh, on Dole Ham's case and trying to get him executed, and you know we'd been fighting for seven months about the fact that Dole was that didn't have veins, wouldn't have vein, wouldn't have accessible veins, that it was going to be torture. Spent seven months fighting. We finally, you know, he 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 ends up. Uh, uh, on the gurney for two and a half hours while they're trying to prick him, prod him, whatever. Uh, but um, uh, a year later on another case, uh, uh, I, should, I was in court with her uh, a little while ago and, and she came up to me afterwards. It was another death penalty case. She came up to me afterwards and asked me, how's Doyle Ham doing? And I thought, Oh, I was like, oh, well, you know, actually he's been getting chemotherapy and um, finally, like he hadn't, he had cancer. He'd never gotten chemotherapy before. Finally getting cancer. And she goes, still alive, huh? And I, I just took this double take because I, I actually thought she was saying, how was Dole Ham doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> but the question was, uh, oh, you were saying he was going to die of his cancer immediately, and he's still alive, isn't he? Right? You, and and I was like, well, wait a minute. Like, I I couldn't believe it. And I was like, wait a minute. You you saw you got you saw what happened, right? I mean, you you were there. You saw what happened. I wasn't. You know, we I, we my medical doctor was right on point, you know what I mean? But the question, but I just kind of like innocently thought that she was asking about the welfare of Bill Ham. And instead it was kind of like this snarky comment about how come the guy's still alive, right? You know? Anyway, all right. Um, Jocelyn, and then Ron, sorry. Great, hi everybody. Thank you so much for uh, this inspiring panel. Uh, my comment picks up on uh, some comments from Alexis and Bernard toward the end of your initial presentation um, about abolition more broadly and the relationship between abolition of the death penalty and abolition of the carceral state or the prison industrial complex. Um, and there is a tension there, as I think is alluded to by your suggestion that we not settle for LWOP. Um, but I'm just sort of acknowledging that there's a tension. I'm curious if people have thoughts about strategies for how to make sure that's not the case at the same time that we all push together to abolish state murder via the death penalty. And I don't, I don't think there's an easy answer. Some things that occur to me include, and I think um, I saw this alluded to elsewhere, uh, you know, pursuing alternative strategies outside of the state like restorative justice at the same time that perhaps people um, are incarcerated for life. Another thing that occurs to me is just focusing on the 
physical torture of death row itself, like almost asking to abolish death row in addition to the death penalty, since that is this, you know, solitary confinement, prolonged incarceration, these forms of torture that then we can relate to other forms of torture within the carceral state. Um, and then the other thing that just came to mind sitting here listening is um, a classic law review article by Robert Cover called Violence in the Word, um, in which he uses the central example of a judge sentencing somebody to the death penalty um, and shows the violence of that moment in the courtroom and then uses that to get the reader, certainly to get me the first time I read it, to see all these different moments in the criminal courtroom as violence too. And so I just wonder, you know, I don't know if it's rhetoric or action or organizing or hopefully a combination, all of those, but I'd be curious people's thoughts on how to push toward abolition democracy at the same time um, that we push to abolish to the death penalty. Right, great, great question. And in fact, yeah, that was the Nadira Saban uh, had asked the question about um, uh, restorative justice as a potential answer as well, right? So there, there have been proposals for other ways of thinking forward. Um, uh, Alexis, do you wanna kick us off with uh, your thoughts on that? I mean, this was really the question in, in our class uh, that Bernard and I taught. And I'm so glad, Jocelyn, that you wrote your piece on, on policing. I mean, we were centrally engaged in that in, in abolition. Um, but this idea that as a society, we must move away from incarceration um, as the solution uh, to all these problems that we encounter, that we have to move away from, from policing, prosecution, and, and prisons. And, and how do we do that? I mean, some of that tension in your question comes from the fact that when you're an individual defense attorney advocating on behalf of an individual who is under an active sentence of death, it is a victory to get the death penalty removed. And so in the community of death penalty practitioners, we celebrate when a client's uh, death, death um, sentence is removed and it's, it's usually replaced with LWOP. And so I think these are hard conversations that are already happening with practitioners. Um, but I know that you know, for, for, for my clients, they don't necessarily want to be sentenced to, to death in prison, which is how many view LWOP. I mean, it changes from person to person, um, but these are hard conversations that practitioners must be having, that academics are having, that our students are being confronted with. And I think um, some, some of the incentives that Kelly talks about with how, how, how do we get the federal government to push the states? Um, she's speaking about abolition. I mean, I wish, I wish we had you as a guest last semester, Kelly, um, in, in discussing how to incentivize governments to really act in a way to focus the attention away from prisons to solve these problems, which are essentially about unmitigated trauma, untreated trauma, uh, pervasive mental health conditions, unsafe housing, access, uh, lack of access to living wage and food, all of these things that we know are the underlying motivators create an environment where, where crime aggravated murders happen. Um, and so I think these are, you, you know, you're, in your question, you know, where, where can we do this legislatively in collective action, uh, in the courts, all of the above. Um, and I think that the, the nation uh, is ready for this kind of conversation. Um, and I was so, um, hopeful watching the uh, millions of people that demonstrated demanding um, equality for, for Black people and that Black lives should matter. And, and this is all at the heart of moving away from a carceral focus as the, the one solution to our, our society's problems. Yeah, yeah. And more broadly, really moving from a kind of a punitive society to maybe, you know, an education society. Right, um, which is something I know uh, Ivan uh, thinks about a lot. I mean, really, really radically transforming the world so that we have a completely different paradigm that we use uh, to understand it. Um, Ron, I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to hear a little bit from you. Um, also, Ms. Greenwood, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to jump in with some thoughts and reactions after after Ron. And I see Hedwig has a question, so. Um, let's uh, go ahead. Ron Tabak has been uh, litigating death penalty cases for, for decades, was uh, Corey Johnson's attorney, and has been perhaps one of the biggest uh, pro bono uh, uh, promo promoters of pro bono uh, representation uh, in this country. Thanks so much for joining us, Ron. 
Thank you, Bernard. I think that this case of Corey Johnson, as well as all the other ones, illustrate a real disconnect between the reality of how society has changed and is changing in their attitudes of cases that we brought today and how we're dealing with the cases of people like Corey Johnson, whose cases were brought earlier. And you get people such as the people who were involved in his trial who say, well, if only we had known that he was intellectually disabled, if only we had known that as we did know about one of his co-defendants against him, we dropped the death penalty. If we had known that Corey was just as intellectually disabled as he was, we would have not sought it against him. Uh, if only the psychologist for the defense, somewhat like the Buck defense witness, had not said that Corey was two points too high on the IQ results to qualify as what was then called mentally retarded, uh, oh, then we would have acted differently. And if cases came up today in Virginia, they don't seek the death penalty anymore. They're now the governor and others trying to abolish it. They haven't executed anybody in years. Um, this case came out of Virginia, was brought originally as a state prosecution, but they moved to federal court. Why? So they could get fewer blacks on the jury and they could have a more favorable to the government uh, jury selection process. Um, you had a system here where the defense lawyers, although the state at that point, this was long before the Supreme Court had held mental retardation as an exclusionary factor, uh, but the state, I mean, the state had done it. I mean, the federal government had done it, the state had not done it. The lawyers, they were not used to doing that. They had never had a trial involving mental retardation, so they had no expertise in how to do it, and they didn't do it. And the post-conviction lawyers also did not have it. And this is where the social workers would have helped is that unlike the other defendant who did have a social worker involved, uh, our psychologist for the defendants didn't go send anybody to New York where Corey grew up. He just found people by telephone and by records. Unfortunately, he usually found the least knowledgeable people about Corey. Um, and so when it was all was said was done and done, um, it was unquestioned by anybody who seriously looked at the facts and the law as it now exists that Corey should have been excluded. And yet, because of the procedural booby traps of the ADPA and otherwise, because we were not asked to come in until 15 years after the conviction, after the first federal habeas was over, we couldn't get any court to consider these on the merits. And the closest we came was an eight to seven vote against end bank consideration last week today by the Fourth Circuit. Um, and we, uh, tried to go through the Department of Justice. We got a very respectful hearing by the pardons office and by other people in the Justice Department. But we knew the president who had just been uh, impeached for the second time the day before was not gonna seriously consider relief. And so a week ago at this very hour, I was on the vi this video on the same iPad with Corey Johnson since I wasn't able to go down there, but he had wanted to speak to me for a half hour after he saw Don Salzman, who was there for the last time in person. And we, he was pleased about one thing very much, which is that we had helped to humanize him from the total distortion of what the press continued to report, including saying he was a Virginian when he was actually a New Yorker, uh, but everything else that got wrong, that we got him in touch with his family who had been in touch by phone, but none had visited him once in the decades he had been on death row, we got a lot of them down there at our expense. And he felt that they and the experts and we, his legal team, had given him a sense that his life was worth something, that he had accomplished something in his life. And we were gonna make sure after his life on this earth ended that he would continue to have value. And he felt better about himself because of that, and I will add one last thing. On the subject of mental illness and the death penalty, uh, the other news that came in last week or the week before was that they have passed and enacted into law the first bill that has in any state an exclusion, not for everybody with serious mental illness at the time of the crime, but for many of them. This was done under Governor DeWine, who was mentioned before, who is a sponsor of the passage of the original Ohio death penalty. There are plenty of Republicans out there in many states. Some have called for abolition. Some have gotten abolition. Some have, will go along with moratoriums. 
the support for the death penalty as it is actually carried out in this country is extremely weak and the support for it is weak. The outrage over this bloodbath of Trump executions is great. There is no big outcry over the big drop in state new death sentences and state executions. And we have more capability of getting things done now. And the proof of that, if we needed any, was look who the key sponsors were. I won't say their names, but one of them is now the President of the United States of the 1994 and other expansions of the federal death penalty. And what are they saying now? And I believe them now, I applaud them now, and they will be very good if they carry through on what they are now saying. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Thanks for that. And thanks for your representation of Corey Johnson. You're it's welcome. important. Um, I wanted to get Ms. Greenwood, but hold on for a second. I've got Ivan on the line with a friend calling in from Coxsackie Correctional. It's really difficult when you're calling from a correctional facility to actually stay on the line. So uh, Ivan, do you wanna go ahead first? No, sure, thank you. Uh, Cedric, uh, my friend's name is Cedric Blackwell. And here he goes, guys, I hope you can hear him. Okay. Go, go Cedric. Yeah, can, can everybody hear me clearly? Yeah, pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, like you tell you, my name is Cedric Blackwell, and uh, uh, currently I'm 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 in my 18th year. I'm working. I just started my 18th year of incarceration uh, towards the 20 to life, and I uh, did hear some of the topic matter. Uh, I don't have a very very broad opinion, but with regards to some of the uh, to some of the topic, uh, uh, with regards to evolution, uh, 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 I mean, uh, getting rid of prisoners. Uh, word. Abolition. Uh, <laughs> abolition. Yeah, uh, I know it's one of those. <laughs> Uh, as far as getting rid of prisons and what goes in its place, it's a little tricky in the sense you got to go back a few steps. Uh, uh, there's no reason, and that's a very long conversation to have prisons because it's it's counterintuitive to to, to what they state their their reasons of of corrections or rehabilitation are because lifestyle inside a prison is abnormal. So to make this uh, uh, inhumane adjustment to abnormality so you can feel normal uh, flies in the face of any potential possibility of correction or rehabilitation you're actually you're, you're going to the machine uh, to be to be made bad as it is um with regards to what do you put into place i think you have to go back way way far in the process of when when do people begin to entertain uh, a way with lifestyle or circumstances or environmental mitigating circumstances that uh, either influence or push someone to to potentially or, or consider a life of crime or anything like that. Not saying that everyone's guilty. Personally, I don't believe there's no reason for prison. I think programs is really what there needs to be. There needs to be some early intervention, uh, but there needs to be uh, something that alerts someone that intervention is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what goes in the place of, uh, of prisons. Uh, and I think it has to be incremental. Of course, you just can't shut all the prisons down and just open up the gates because that's a problem. But I don't think there's a particular need for them one way or the other, uh, because that's not, it doesn't fix the problem. Uh, it's not even a Band-Aid prison. Prisons actually, in most cases, uh, uh, I think all cases, to be honest with you, exacerbate the problem that's, that's already existing. So I think whatever cure or remedy exists way, way, way in the beginning, way, way before that. Um, there is something interesting that I've been pointing out about, you know, how do you respect uh, victims who've been victims of crime? And that's very hard. And I don't want to, I don't want to, speak out of turn and assume what you know what would what would uh, make a victim feel like they've uh, received any justice or, or any compensation for because you know they've been subject to sometimes in many cases some very heinous uh, traumatizing situations uh, uh, and I don't want to speak out of turn and say well this is what you do for a victim I do know of, of instances where victims have actually tried to forge a relationship and build a bridge with their victimizers to get some understanding of what was happening at the time. Uh, and that has uh, proven mildly successful when, when both parties are willing to do that. And that depends on the you know, circumstance. A mother or a father losing a child to a gun violence or something violent, they're not, they're not particularly motivated, understandably so, to go meet with the killer of their child or their brother or their sister or their mother, father, you know, whatever the case may be. But in the past, there has been a, a, a modicum of success with that because it, it kind of uh, opens and pulls the curtain back on both parties of what's going on their pain your frustrations or your circumstances and, and there is some middle ground that can be reached and there's actually been cases where you know victims of of, 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 of tragic crimes that have actually turned around and forged uh, just these uh, um, almost indescribable friendships with 
the killers of their of their relatives or loved ones. Um, but to 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 and then on the on the flip side is you know how do you how do you satisfy the the, the person who's committed the crime? Every criminal at some stage is, is, is seeking some type of uh, um, uh, the word the word eludes me right now, but. The, they need something. They're, they're lacking something. Uh, whether it's uh, something with regards to mental health or, or mental health, I mean, or, or just trauma. I, I think there's some trauma involved. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not certain. And again, I don't want to. I can't speak for nobody. I can speak for me. Um, you know, my frustrations as a prisoner, uh, uh, and what would make things better is I need someone to actually consider my existence, my humanity. I think that's the first thing that goes out the window. You, you know, you, you, you sacrifice humanity to become a prisoner or even to be labeled a prisoner. Uh, 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 so I, I believe it's somewhere in there. I don't have the answers. I mean, <laughs> I hope nobody on the panel was expecting <laughs> some type of epiphany of an answer. Uh, uh, I know that it's a person uh, uh, in my mid-50s uh, serving a long, a long, long sentence. This hasn't been my fourth sentence. Um, I'm sure there's something there, but I'm not certain what it is. Um, but going back to the to the original thing about about the prisons, um, I don't believe there's any particular reasons for prisons because they don't do anything. They don't serve a purpose at all. They are counterintuitive uh, uh, to the process, and unfortunately, they have all these these uh, uh, they, all these misnomers in a correctional facility. Uh, uh, and they believe the process is rehabilitation and they have all type of therapeutic language that, they, you know, they want to try to assist you in making a smooth and successful transition back into society. And that's impossible because when you come through this particular machine, uh, you're turned upside down. You, you know, you have to live in an abnormal, you know, you almost have to uh, go back, uh, you know, hundreds of years to the, uh, almost to the bestial, animalistic lifestyle to feel normal in this environment. That's any environment. Okay, it's behind the wall, maximum security, medium, because that's just the order of the day. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? So there's yeah. no need. I think uh, the, the, the need lies somewhere in, in, in something programmatic, something right. that really goes to the heart of the matter, that, that seeks out, evaluates the issue, and directly addresses the issue, whether it's family trauma, whether it's uh, something outside the trauma. Of course, there's some environmental right. stuff, that, that takes place too. I mean, I don't, it, this is all right. the news these days, all the systemic and all the inequalities, and, and, and we, we understand that that's all relevant and it's, it, it plays a part. I believe, I believe some of it is there. All right. Let me just say that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shedrick. Thank you so much for, for, for calling in and for sharing with us. And also, mm -hmm. I got to say, uh, you got to come join us on. Uh, at the next uh, uh, abolition democracy as well, because we're going to be talking about prison abolition, okay? And that's going to be on yeah. on, on, on Thursday, February fourth at six fifteen p.m. So if you can if you can also listen in and call in and and, and participate in that conversation, we'd really love to have you with us, okay? Um, yeah, definitely. Now, I'll write that down. I'll, I'll make sure that I have a reminder. If I can get on, I'd, I'd love to call and uh, I'd love to play whatever role I can play in this process. Okay, that would be great, Cedric. Thanks so much. And, uh, and I know Ivan read a beautiful, recited a beautiful poem of yours. Uh, Fonda just put it in the uh, in the chat box, and everyone can see it on YouTube of Ivan uh, 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 reciting your poem today. So uh, thanks so much for that as well. Um, now, as I see uh, Ivan's phone, um, it's reminding me that we're at 2:46, and we're supposed to we're supposed to end at 2:45, and I know 2:47, and I know that um, everybody uh, has uh, has given a lot of their time today. Hedwig, I see you have a question, but I I, I wanted to hear lastly from Mrs. Greenwood. Maybe if Ms. Greenwood could kind of close us out, I think that would be uh, that would be that would be best. Um, Hedwig, um, maybe. Um, uh, do you want to say a word about your question, and then we'll we'll close out with Ms. Greenwood? Yeah, I can do that. It actually, I think, fits very well, because I was wondering about this process that transforms people's stance on the death penalty. Mm -hmm. And so um, we've heard several examples of, like, individual stories really compelling people to um, change their stance, but then often also only in individual cases. And I was wondering whether people could say a bit more about this like principle transformation, right? Whether it's just like whether individual stories can also lead to this like principled stance mm -hmm. against the death penalty. 
then or like how people have seen this play out and also like people of course who had you know family members being on death row or having been executed by the state like see this in their environment great great and that is really an important uh, an important question it's how to how to how to turn the individual into the collective in a way and how to turn some of these individual stories into collective stories um so i think we can all we can all think about that and uh, and think about ways um and but what i'd like to do i think is to is to end with uh, with ms greenwood um thank you so much for joining us and maybe you have some final thoughts this was a long conversation there were lots of lots of important parts of it for you to pick up on and uh and leave us with a few final thoughts. Again, I thank you for allowing me to be a part of the panel. Uh, in listening to the other panel members, um, it brought to mind the various hardships that family members have with a person on death row. You have uh, very seldom or never see a rich person on the road. So it makes it distinctly hard for family members to visit. Uh, there's a lot of uh, expense involved, travel. I've met some persons that did not have transportation. These things all play a large part in the stress level that family members have. Um, I'd like to thank the panel members again for being a part of this and I have uh, come to know a lot more about the federal death penalty and it uh, varies uh, state by state. But all in all, I am thankful to see that Suzanne uh, will be formulating various means that we as family members can have support that's ready and available to us and uh, to help us deal with such uh, an event as the death penalty. Uh, I invite any last minute questions that I can address more to the point than just telling you the many things that happen to family members and that we, the things that we deal with by having family members on death row. We're always also mindful of those that are affected on the other side and have great sympathy and empathy for those persons. Uh, we carry that burden also as well as they do. Uh, they are not uh, out of sight, out of mind. We consider them and think of them daily also. So again, um, if there's any last minute questions that you have of me, uh, I'll again say thank you for allowing me mm -hmm. to be a part of this panel. And uh, I'm always available at any time to answer any questions and be supportive of any efforts to help those uh, that are in the situation that I'm in, because it is a lifelong burden that you carry. Thank you so much, Mrs. Greenwood. Thank you so much. Thank you all uh, for participating. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your knowledge and your experiences with us. Liliana, thank you so much and for everything you've been doing covering this. Uh, Kelly, thank you so much as well, and for all of your work, Susanna as well. And uh, thank you, Alexis, uh, for being such an extraordinary colleague. Thank you all. Thank you for joining Mrs. Greenwood. Thank you again, uh, Jocelyn. Thanks for coming, Sonia, Ivan, Natan, Tom, Mayaki, everyone. Uh, Ron, thanks for joining. Uh, we meet next on, uh, on Thursday, February 4th. At 6.15 p.m., we'll return to our evening sessions uh, and we'll be uh, looking, we'll be talking about uh, prison abolition, uh, particularly with Reginald Dwayne Betts, uh, who is a poet and uh, was formerly incarcerated, Allegra McLeod at Georgetown, who has written remarkable work on abolition. So uh, thank you all, and please join me in thanking everyone uh, virtually. Take care. And uh, let's uh, work together uh, on this historic day to make this happen, uh, the abolition of the federal death penalty and of the yes. death penalty more broadly. All right, thanks. Thank, Thank you, you, Bernard. Thank you, everybody. God bless. Yes. I'll see if I can later.
if they'd be running this at all, but. Thank you again, Mrs. Greenwood. Yes, thank you. Okay, I'll be in touch separately. I appreciate Please. it. Take care. Take care of yourself.